Okay, we all set? Yep. Yeah, we are live. All right, thank you. Um, welcome everybody to the June 2nd Northampton School Committee meeting. Mayor Narkowitz, uh, who typically chairs the meetings, was called away on an emergency meeting, but will be joining us uh, a little bit later. So until then, as vice chair of the school committee, I'll be chairing tonight's meeting. Um, <clears throat> pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued on March 12, 2020, tonight's meeting of the school committee will be held using remote participation. And our meeting uh, is being recorded and broadcast by uh, Northampton Open Media. Um, I want to begin by just saying that tonight's meeting is somewhat different from our typical meetings. Um, tonight's meeting is one of what is four quarterly meetings that the school committee has um, and that we hold throughout the year, which is focused on some aspects, some key aspect of student success. So for example, in the past, we've had meetings on academic indicators of success, uh, non-academic indicators. We've devoted entire meetings focused on school improvement plans, et cetera. Um, so tonight we'll be looking at and discussing results of an external review that was conducted of our district by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Additional agenda items were added due to the timing of other important matters, and those will happen after our focus discussion on the district review. Um, our next regular, our next regular or typical school committee meeting will be held next Thursday on June 11th. So, uh, can the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Condon, I'm Mayor Condon. Member Condon. I, he put a note in the chat yeah. that he had yeah, to log out. Uh, okay, but I'm going to I'm going to count him as here. Um, Member Levy, present. Member Kaufman, present. Member Goldman, present. Oh, good. I'm glad your audio got fixed. Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. Present. The mayor is not here yet. Uh, Member Busansky. Present. Member Fallon. Present. Member Serafie Cox. Present. Mr. Vice Chair, you have a quorum. So can I, can I just point out something else that's in the chat. I don't, I think that this was probably looked at very closely after what happened last week, but um, member Condon is chatting that he didn't see this, this meeting posted on the city website. John, I just checked that and I, it is posted and the right meeting ID and password are on the website, on the city website and it's dated May 29th at 1220. Okay, and then we have a, another another note in the chat saying that the agenda is in public. You need to request access. Hmm. Let me see. I don't know what that. I actually uh, looked at it earlier today on the city's website because I had not gotten the normal email with the link, or at least I didn't see it. Uh, so I looked on the city's website to find it and was able to view it, at least on my phone. So okay. I don't... Uh, it, it, people, people should try it again now because I just fixed the link. I don't know why it wasn't on. It was on when I put it on there. So uh, hopefully people can try it now. Uh, I I was able to also see it. I checked, I think it was yesterday, but I'm wondering if we should reply to the chat because it's possible it required an MPS login and I might have been logged in in the background. So I wouldn't have realized that there was a problem and we all could be in that situation, but I too checked and was able to get in. No, it should be everybody, at least the agenda, everybody with a link should be able to do it. Okay. I think the, the chat says that people can't get the agenda from them. That's what I mean. All right. Um, I can see it when I'm signed into my NPS email and not when I'm signed into my regular Gmail. I'm trying to. I'm trying to access it from the calendar listing. And That's if I'm in my school email, I can open it, but not my personal. 
Who was talking just then? Sorry. Would that was you... member Serafie Cox. Okay. I don't think, no, I don't think it was member Serafie Cox. I think it was somebody no, else. No. It wasn't me. And, uh, <laughs> and I think uh, I would just ask people to put their hand up before they speak so we can figure out who's talking and uh, we can have the chair, the vice chair call on you. Yeah. Is, does everybody have the agenda now who is in the meeting? Is the agenda different from what you emailed us for the May 28th? No, and I'm sorry, I thought I emailed it out on Friday to everyone. Um, maybe I didn't, um, but it's, I just sent another, it's the same exact and it's up there. I'll, I just resent it so you should have it again. If it's the same, there's no need to resend. Okay. Um, Dr. Provost, do you see a, an area of concern here with moving forward to the meeting? Uh, the meeting was posted. I, I, I'm not on the city website right now because I'm in this um, meeting. It looks like some people were able to access it from the city website and others were able to access it from the school website. So I think we can could at least um, start. I will also, I will try to text the mayor to see if we can get a, a contact with the city solicitor, but I think that um, at least for the purpose of hearing comments, I see that there are several people who have hands up, I presume, for comments. I think yeah. that at least we could do that. Okay. It does look like there's enough evidence from people that are checking here that they're, that they're looking at the city website. Um, yeah, okay. So the question is whether there is a link, a Zoom link, and there's a question about whether it was posted on. I think the city website is sufficient. That's what held us up last time, right? So as long as we're posting it on the city website, the question then would be whether um, the city website has the appropriate link. Uh, I'm, I'm now in, and uh, I'm looking at the city website, and I do not see a link. How did you get in, John? To the city website? No, to the meeting. Oh, I, uh, I'm using my laptop. No, but I mean, which? how did you get the link if it wasn't the city? The email from Annie? From the, the link is always embedded in the agenda. And it's the same link as it would have been last Thursday. So wherever you get the agenda, you can click on the link in the agenda and it will take you to the Zoom meeting. OK. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Provost, you're contacting the mayor, run this by him, and we'll move forward with the public comment. And um, if we need to reschedule, I guess we'll have to have another public comment, which is consistent, I think, with giving the community an opportunity to share. Yep. Okay, so um, in terms of public comment, um, we had one person, Mar Marissa Hochstetter, I think, uh, sign up, and we could also, after she's done, if anybody else wants to participate, I would ask that you go to the, um, raise your hand by going to the participants, um, uh, click on participants on the bottom of your screen, and that should take you to an opportunity for you to, I'm sorry, um, From there, you should be able to raise your hand, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm looking at a different screen, but from there, you should be able to raise your hand. I see one person. So why don't we start with uh, Ms. Hochstetter. Um, you have three minutes, and thank you very much for coming tonight, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Please start when you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'll just say I was able to find the agenda on the city website and reach out to speak. So it was out there <laughs> in, some, in some form to that conversation. Um, my name is Marissa Hochstetter. I live in Ward 2 um, with my husband, David Whitehill. I'm the, we're the parents of two third graders at Jackson Street School. And um, I wanted to just take a moment. I understand that Superintendent Provost's reopening plan is forthcoming. But before everything is sort of said and done, I wanted to express a concern that many parents I know share and we've been talking a lot about that we really 
learn from our experience over the last few months to create a successful model for the next school year, which could very possibly include uh, remote learning in some form. We have two kids, uh, as I said, in two different classrooms in the same grade in the same school, and our experience has varied greatly. Each teacher has made their own decision about what technology is being used, how much structure to give the students, and most importantly, how much personal interaction to have with the students. In both classrooms, there's been very little live interaction between the students and the teachers. When I asked my children what they missed most about school, they said they want to talk to their teachers. Um, We've learned recently that the academic content was supposed to be coming from the central district. This was not made clear when this process began, and it's confusing when all previous interaction has been through their teachers and the principals of the school. So it's really important, I think, that we, um, that principals and schools maintain the autonomy so as not to lose the personality that makes our community so special. That said, we need to be really clear about what we expect from our teachers and that there be accountability and oversight, which is something that feels like it's really been missing in the last few months. We have to set high standards and find ways to monitor the teaching as we would in a real space and not somehow treat this as a different kind of um, education in our kids' lives. We have to find ways to evaluate student progress, something that also has not been happening, and not simply give them lists of links to click on mindlessly with no feedback and no live interaction. So I'm asking that whatever plan is developed be done with transparency, with an opportunity for community involvement. We have so many talented, smart people in this community that have not been called on, as far as we can tell, to volunteer um, or contribute to this conversation and that the plan be informed by experts, but tailored for our community and not just sort of copy and pasted from elsewhere. So um, I would ask too that this committee, especially at this moment, take its oversight role really seriously. The superintendent's plan for moving forward will determine how comfortable people are sending their kids back to school. There are, there are those conversations happening now that people are afraid they're not gonna feel comfortable sending them to school in the fall. Um, that we will ensure that students don't lose more months of learning time, that essentially we've sort of written off the last couple of months, and that in many ways this plan, and I think the school committee's um, blessing of that plan, will really define our values and priorities as a community. So um, I wanted to, again, before things are sort of done in the next couple of weeks, just um, share my voice, but share a lot of the conversations that we've been having um, as parents and friends and neighbors um, that people are really paying attention and um, we don't want the last couple of months to somehow um, be what happens again in the fall, that we have an opportunity to do something uh, different in a planful way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see uh, Jonathan, Mr. Jonathan Knapp is hand is raised. Is this for a public session? I mean, yes. this for public comment? Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Knapp and I'm an English teacher at Northampton High School. I use he, him pronouns. Last Monday, four Minneapolis police officers murdered George Floyd. In the weeks since, we've seen protests for freedom and justice across the nation. And across the nation, we've seen police departments use escalation tactics such as pepper spray, tear gas, rubber bullets, and more. Yesterday, Northampton Police Department officers <clears throat> pepper sprayed protesters. Such actions stand in direct contrast to the Northampton Public Schools mission to build communities of engaged students while nurturing kindness, empathy, and tolerance. I'm here tonight to ask you to terminate the contract between Northampton Public Schools and the Northampton Police Department. Ending this relationship will show that our district condemns police brutality and will be a much needed opportunity for the district to really start practicing anti-racism by rejecting any association with systemic violence in the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Dr. Provost, I just see your hand is raised. Did you want to share something? Sure, I just wanted to say that I went on the city website during public comment time and the agenda is there with the link to this meeting. So I don't think there's any problem moving forward. 
Okay, thank you. And we have, seems to be verified by two or three other individuals who have said that maybe the link is not automatic, but I don't think that's it's a convenience, but it's not a necessity. So um, does anybody else in public um, have anything to share? I don't have everybody on screen, but if you having any difficulty using the method of going to participants and raising your hand that way, I'll do a quick uh, look to see if anybody physically has their hands raised, which would be fine. Okay, thank you. So um, next part of our agenda is announcements. Do you, any members of the school committee have any announcements to share? Uh, Member Levy. Thanks. Um, I just want to briefly share that I met yesterday with the search committee for the JFK principal, um, invited by Celeste, and had a really productive conversation about how to um, how to infuse um, anti-bias um, practices so that the search committee can be really working towards an inclusive search. Um, and I was really pleased with um, how open folks were. They had great questions. And Celeste, as the head of the search, seems to be really moving forward in positive ways. So just wanted to share that with the committee. Thank you, Member Levy. Uh, anybody else have any, any other members have anything, any announcements to share? Okay. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, the major part, as I announced earlier, of tonight's meeting is to reflect on the um, district review. And to start doing that, um, I wanted to read some background, mostly that the school committee has received, um, to make sure that the audience members in the community are also up to date with what tonight's uh, topic is about. So bear with me, but I think this is an important sort of background, and I'll read this out in about two minutes. Uh, the student success topic of tonight's meeting will be on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's district review. From here on in, I'll discuss, I'll refer to the department as DESI. Our targeted review was conducted by consultants from DESI um, and focused on the following district standards, curriculum and instruction, assessment, and student support. The targeted review identifies systems and practices that might be impeding improvement, as well as those most likely to be contributing to positive results. The DESE team reviewed documentation, data, and reports for two days before conducting a three-day visit to the Northampton Public Schools from February 4th through February 6, 2019. The site included 24 hours of interviews and focus groups with approximately 270 stakeholders, including school committee members, district administrators, school staff, students, students' families, and teacher association representatives. The team conducted three focus groups with 87 elementary school teachers, 55 middle school teachers, and 42 high school teachers. The review itself also includes findings about instruction based on classroom observations of 68 classes throughout the district, 28 at the high school, 18 at the middle school, and 22 at the, between the four elementary schools. Subsequent to the on-site review, the team met for two days to develop findings and recommendations before submitting a draft to DESE. DESE then edited the draft and a draft report was sent to the district for our factual review before it was published on the DESE website in January 2020. In preparation for tonight's discussion, school committee members and I believe members of the ALT team were asked to keep uh, several questions in mind to help guide our conversation this evening and to help um, our conversation move towards areas we feel are most salient both now and as we make plans for the future. And those questions were, A, which findings and or overwhelming themes in the report are you most impressed by? Which are you most surprised by? When thinking about positive aspects of our education system that we need to maintain and or strengthen, what are your most important takeaways? When thinking about where we need to improve as a district, what are your most important takeaways? 
And then two specific questions, which I think will guide us as we begin our uh, movement into developing a, a new district improvement plan. Um, first is, as we're now about to embark on a new district improvement plan, what are your core themes what are the core themes and findings from this review that we need to ensure are reflected in the goals and strategies of our new plan? And finally, given how much is unknown at this time, which findings and overarching themes reflected in the report will be particularly helpful to us as we continue to plan for the future? So importantly, a couple of other things to keep in mind before we begin uh, tonight's discussion. Um, Please keep in mind that the review itself was conducted approximately 16 months ago, and also that it was a targeted review. So the review focused on curriculum and instruction, assess student assessment and student support. But importantly, this was not a comprehensive review. Uh, and if it was, um, they would have looked at other district standards and indicators, which they did not do. And those would have been leadership and governance, human resources and professional development, and financial and asset management. Um, and lastly, um, I want to say a few, a couple of people asked me what the objective is for tonight. And honestly, the agenda setting committee, the, the agenda setting team didn't really discuss that. But I took a, I took a, <laughs> I, I took, I made an attempt to do so myself. Um, take it or leave it. I think it makes sense. I think first of all, we want to generate common understanding of what the report says and surface those areas that we as a district are doing well, as well as other areas that we feel are in need of improvement and further support. Um, second objective is I think we wanna better understand what areas related to our district and student success have been worked on since the review was done or are now happening as a result of the review's recommendations themselves. And finally, I think as we're now about to embark on a new district improvement plan, I think this gives us a, a great opportunity as a school committee to really um, make sure that our priorities are well known in terms of the educational goals and strategies that we would like to see included in the district improvement plan and as a district, uh, as, a district as a whole over the next few years. Um, Leading up to tonight, there was an idea that uh, rather than just the school committee discussing it, that we would also invite all team members. And I want to turn it over to Dr. Provost to discuss a little bit about how that team was involved and how they would like to proceed in getting their information across and be part of tonight's discussion. Sure. Thank you. Uh, late, late last week after this meeting was first scheduled but then canceled due to a posting error, a member of this committee reached out to the agenda setting group and asked, since we're having the meeting again anyways, would it be possible to have the alt team weigh in on the questions that member Kaufman had posed, as well as the school committee members? Um, and so uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the entire alt team today. Uh, certainly our goal would not be to um, cause the meeting to go any longer or to um, be the, the dominant voice in the conversation. And so uh, instead of having us all weigh in on each of the questions, we have one member who's ready to present on each of the questions when they come up. So um, my, my expectation before um, Member Kaufman also was thrust into the role of facilitator for the whole meeting was that he would be facilitating this part of the conversation. If that still works, um, I would uh, defer to you on how you'd like to approach the questions. Sure, yes, happy to do that. And I think um, because of the way the all team is, is um, set up and just because of the fact that we need some, organ some organization to this, I thought it'd be best if we just um, go through these question by question um, in my in preparing notes for tonight, I definitely there's some overlap, but I think that this would give people an opportunity to at least uh, share when they want to share and maybe just say, you know, I feel the same way as somebody else uh, discussed. I think as we go through these questions, they naturally go from more general to more specific. So why don't we give that a shot unless anybody else has any thoughts on the best way to accommodate this part of the meeting? Okay, so 
Um, I don't have the list in front of me, Dr. Provost. I can pull it up, but why don't, can we begin with one of the all team members that had a response to which findings and or, over, and or overarching themes in the report uh, were you most impressed with? Sure, and we have Dr. Cheevers to respond to that question. Dr. Chivers, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you. I just I want to apologize for my wiggling a little bit. I have a ruptured vertebrae, so I'm a little wiggly here. Um, so I have question number one. Um, which findings and our overarching themes in the report are you most impressed with? And um, what, of course, as curriculum director, and this was a focused attempt to look at our curriculum, of course, I'm, we were very impressed at the fact that DESE was um, so intent on looking specifically at our curriculum, the importance of a clearly articulated, comprehensive curriculum, of course, is one of the most important areas of needs addressed in the report. Um, it wasn't finished when Desi came to look at um, and to uh, do all of the interviews, but of course it was shortly thereafter. Um, also the key Desi roles that our literacy and our of... math coaches and our K-12 uh, department chairs, our curriculum teacher leaders and our teacher teams play in the development of, of curriculum. And the report recognized all of those roles and structures and systems that we have um, that really made for um, a very collaborative organization of the curriculum activities. And those roles and structures will, of course, continue. Um, so I am um, impressed with the fact that um, they recognize curriculum as the blueprint for, for learning, that you know, the blueprint is for learning is the most important piece um, in terms of, of you know, it's, the, it's the bedrock piece for moving curriculum forward, for moving learning forward, that it contributes to the overall success of a school district by clearly defining what students will know, understand, and be able to do. Um, that it provides a content-based resource for deep critical outcome analysis, that it provides an essential component to an equitable education, and that's so important, um, provides a resource for ELL, special education, and all educators to support our diverse learners and their peers. Curriculum provides opportunities to link professional development and district improvement, course and provides all stakeholders with the opportunity to learn about our district curricula. Um, and I gave a lengthy and detailed presentation on February 13th and I won't go into that um, you know into a great deal of depth. Um, but I would like to mention a few things that related to how curriculum provides an essential component to an equitable education, which is one of the most essential components that it guarantees a high quality, common outcome-based plan for each subject area and grade level, that it assesses all students with the same measurement tool and descriptors and expectations with adjustments as needed and required, that it provides a foundation on which to differentiate instruction, maintains alignment within and between subject area classes and provides an organized a uh, systematic resource to critically examine materials and texts and instructional strategies for bias and perspective taking. So those are all of the things that our curriculum now brings us and that I think are a real highlight of the, the work that we have done. Um, going forward, we look, um, we look forward to thinking more about our grading and this is really key thinking more about how our grading and reporting can more accurately and transparently report student learning and how it might empower students to take a more active role in, the lear in their learning to become more independent learners. And then we look forward to fine tuning our summative assessments and rubrics 
and checking for alignment to the power standards as we move through the curriculum units. And next steps also include sharing the curriculum with caregivers and students and publishing the curriculum review plan. Um, and of course that plan will require a lot of thought and consideration, um, you know, considering our challenging circumstances. Um, and, um, and then finally, the importance of maintaining our curriculum in general is critical. Um, this coming year, it's especially useful as we use our Atlas district-wide to determine standards not taught, units not complete. Teachers are using their existing curricula to make plans for the new year. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of um, information about how we're, how we're using the curriculum right now and how we're using Atlas is teachers are using um, referring to the units that they have completed and not completed. And we're having transition meetings between, um, between grade levels. We have had our fifth and sixth grade meetings and we've had our ninth and 10th grade meetings this week or we are having them this week with all of the subject areas. So there's this really rich conversation going on right now about what has been done to fidelity, what has been taught to fidelity, and what may not have because it was offered online and perhaps not as many kids participated as we would have liked or something of that nature. So, and then we're thinking about how we may reorganize some of those uh, some of those standards a little bit for next year. So that's a little bit about what we're using the curriculum for. But um, I think the fact that Desi has recognized that um, you know the curriculum is um, you know it's the blueprint, it's the bedrock of our work in the district, um, and uh, and that it's uh, you know at this point it's in very very good shape and very proud of the work that the teachers and all of the teacher leaders have done. Um, you know I think that's uh, that's a really good um, place to think about in terms of our solidity um, as a district. Thank you very much, Dr. Chevers. Um, so let's open it up to uh, school committee members uh, for the first question about which findings or overarching themes in the report are you most impressed with? Um, I don't think that we're, that we're looking for, um, I, mean, I, I think just in the, just to, to, in consideration of time, let's try and limit how many things are discussed. And again, if you are a person that is hearing something that is exactly what you yourself wanted to say, I think it's perfectly fine just to reiterate and say, I feel the same way um, that will help both in terms of prioritizing what we're hearing, as well as uh, keeping the conversation uh, moving along. So which of the school committee members would want to share first? Member Levy? Um, thanks. I well, will not share about the curriculum since I would have said that, but it was eloquently said already. Um, I, uh, the other point that I'll make just really briefly that really struck me in reading through was the formative assessments used in the elementary schools. Um, and the points this came out over and over about how, how um, there's been a lot of a collaborative efforts to ensure they're not only really um, structurally sound, but that um, they, they're, uh, they're really used to enhance student learning, to, to really talk about student needs um, and that it can be a model for the middle school oh, and the high school. So many of you are okay. Does anybody, uh, any other school committee members, want to share? I'll just say. Um, I don't see anybody else's hands raised. I'll say from my perspective, um, this is very much related to member Levy, but in observed classrooms at the elementary level, the team found nearly all ELA and math lessons were designed to support and challenge all students. Um, that is just unbelievably positive. Um, there is, um, I don't know, to me that, that just stood out as just incredibly impressive. It's a really tough thing to do and they were looking at it and we have, we've prioritized the curriculum the lessons and the resources for elementary over the last several years. And it looks like, according to the report, that's paying off. Um, we do have some hands raised now. Thank you. Um, 
Dr. Voss, Member Voss. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, and I'll just add to it that I was really impressed by the coaching model in the K through five school um, grades. And I did come away with a question that doesn't need to be answered now. Um, and, and that was at some point to just understand if all teachers utilize the coaches or um, how coaches time gets divided up. But I really enjoyed reading about it and thought it was a, a big positive. Thank you. And uh, Member Condon. Uh, I was going to chime in with the, the same comments uh, as Member Voss uh, regarding the, the coaching model found as a strength um, and how it kind of uh, ties in with the district's efforts to expand that coaching up into the upper grades. Thank you. And Member Buzaski? Uh Yes, I'll just say ditto because I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> All right, I see no other hands raised. Um, we'll move on to question number two, which is kind of the opposite of which findings, which findings and or overarching themes in the report uh, are you most surprised by? And, um, Dr. Provost, who did you have in line to um, represent the all team on this? Thank you. I'll take that one. Oh, good I one. think that my my overall response uh, at the, the risk of possibly sounding um, somewhat, I don't know, I told you so about this is that there really weren't any surprises in the report for me or for the members of the all team. Um, sometimes you get one of these reports done by an outside group and it's coming from such a different perspective. You have um, questions about its validity. However, in this case, I think that the, um, the review confirmed feelings that we already had within the district, certainly feelings that I already had about our strengths and weaknesses. So um, the district review identified the coaching model, our elementary response to instruction model, and all of the common assessments we've developed for elementary teachers as strengths. Um, these are all initiatives that we have worked very hard on because we felt they were important for student learning. And I'm happy to see that DESE saw them as strengths as well. Um, student engagement and access were also seen as much stronger in the elementary level as Member Kaufman had just said. And that's not surprising to me given all of the effort that we've put into inclusion models at the elementary level in the, in the recent years. It also was not a surprise to see that DESE identified establishing a documented district curriculum as a priority. As Dr. Cheever said, it is the blueprint for learning and it is a blueprint that we were struggling with. Um, and I would say even earlier this year, we're struggling with getting the final pieces in place, especially at the secondary level. But as um, she indicated, that's now been done. Um, this was the major goal of our last district improvement plan, which is expiring now. Um, it was the only goal that we had stretched out over five years because we knew it was such an important goal and such a difficult um, goal to achieve. Um, so when DESE came, that, was, that work hadn't been done and they really encouraged us to stay the course with that. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised that they identified the, length, the lack of a documented curriculum as a weakness at the time they were there. Um, similarly, it, it wasn't surprising to me that DESE found it to be a weakness that we hadn't established a set of common assessments at the upper levels. Um, that continues to be an area of struggle for us. It's one of the bedrocks of equity, I believe, so that if we have students taking the same courses and assessed by the same instruments, then we can say something about how effectively they learned the material um, covered in those courses. And we're not there yet, um, but that certainly is work for us to do. And it, it's work that I am really motivated to engage in. And so um, I, I accept that as a, as, a, um, as a criticism that will push us to excellence from DESE. Um, also, it wasn't a surprise to me that DESE found that some groups of students encounters barriers 
accessing the full range of learning experiences offered in the district? How many times have I spoken to this group about the inequities our system presents, especially for English learners and especially for Hispanic and Latino students? I think it will be essential that we prioritize these students as we begin to think about reopening. I think as we move to the next stage, um, they have identified our weaknesses correctly and we should hold them up as priorities and especially hold up the students who are identified as having the most struggles now um, with a preferential option as we begin the, the process of thinking of reopening schools. Thank you, Dr. Provost. So, I mean, just in, in summary, it sounds like you you found this to be a very valid and reliable report, accurately reflecting. Absolutely. And most of your, you, would you say the same for the your conversations with the alt team? I would. Okay. Um, Member Condon? Uh, yes, thank you. I just want to uh, speak to the weakness that Dr. Provost mentioned regarding student engagement and higher order thinking. Um, somewhat in defense of the middle and high school, I know in the narrative that's identified as a weakness, but if you look at the data they actually collected in their observations at the end of the report on page 52, uh, the scores are nearly identical across all three uh, grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school. So there's not a glaring weakness in the data. So I'm not sure why they identified that as a weakness when th the numbers that they put together didn't demonstrate that. And uh, member Sarafi Cox. Excuse me, can I just wanna interrupt right now to let you all know that the mayor is now in the meeting. Thank you, continue. <laughs> the mayor has entered the building. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I just wanted to, um, uh, this is perhaps also not a surprise, but wanted to echo what uh, the superintendent was saying about equity issues and the importance that I hope that this committee places on those issues as we are moving forward uh, with, um, with utilizing this and uh, all of the key decisions that we are going to be making uh, in the, the coming months. And uh, Member Gold? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Just because my internet's not great right now. Yes. Okay, um, so I guess, um, and first, I, I was echoing everything everyone said in the first response, so I didn't add to it um, in terms of the impression, what was most impressive. Um, the surprise piece was, um, one of the things they found that was most impressive was that the effective assessment and student support practices are in place at the elementary level. Um, and then they also go to say, and I guess it's more of a clarification or, or if there's a way to better understand what they were meaning by this, then on page three, they say the district does not have formal metrics by which it measures its growth or success. And it would seem that effective assessments would have embedded in them growth measures. Um, and I know that from, at least from previous reports that we've gotten, there are, um, there are embedded growth measures within the data the district collects in the variety of assessments. And so um, I just, I guess I was surprised to, that they made that, that that statement was there and and then in term, more su surprised in terms of not really understanding, I guess, that piece of it. And maybe there was more to it that they meant there. Um. Member Sarfi Cox, you have your hands raised again. Is that, did you want to add something? No, I just, uh, usually the mayor raise, unraises my hand, so I didn't realize that we were in charge of that ourselves. Okay, I'll, I can I'll do unraise that my hand. I know how, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will add uh, for myself that, um, you know, it's been, it's been um, six plus years since I've had a kid at the high school, so I'm a little out of touch with, you know, who the teachers are and what's happening day to day. It's a little bit easier when you when you have kids in school, but I will say that I was surprised by the statements regarding the instruction at the high school. Specifically, they talked about at the high school teacher directed instruction prevail, and that overall the district faces an ongoing challenge to ensure a common understanding of high quality instructional practices district wide. 
Um, so that to me was surprising. Couple that with what Dr. Provost mentioned before, which is the, the avenues of assessment and the lack of assessment um, or an assessment system at the secondary level, level affects teachers' ability to provide consistent content experiences from class to class, to monitor individual student progress, and to identify students' specific learning needs in a timely way. So I certainly think as a school committee, we need to um, focus on ways that we can support the building up of that model, which seemed to be rather exemplary at elementary school. And those elementary school kids are going to be, and parents are going to be expecting similar experiences as they reach middle and high school. So the timing seems rather adequate to me. Seems right. Member Boss. Thanks. I'm going to follow up on what Member Kaufman just said. And um, I have had kids at the high school for consecutively for many years now. I'm still there. And this part did surprise me. I not saying it doesn't happen the way it was presented and it surprised me. It's probably part of a high school experience. It's not um, an experience that I've witnessed very much. Um, and I, I think that's an important thing to recognize. And maybe what we're getting out of the report is different kids can have really different experiences at our high school. And um, first step is recognizing that and improving it. But I do want to say there are really strong aspects of learning at our high school that to me didn't come out in this report. And that surprised me. And it might have just been a sampling issue with a relatively short time where the visitors went um which classes they visited but it also got me thinking about just this assessment and i hear what people are saying where dr provost where you're saying certain classes we should have similar assessments and i completely respect that but i also wish they would have said we have this really rich um offering of ap classes and that's what we have you know we can debate whether or not that's the right form of more advanced classes, but we have these AP classes and final exams in these AP classes are AP questions. And I and t our teachers know how to grade those AP questions. So I think they shortchange some of what, what's going on there in terms of there is a metric to measure these things on um, at the high school level. And then the other thing that's related to this that I'd like us as a group to consider is just the need to involve families more at JFK and the high school and to somehow visit the conversation of potential parent teacher conferences tied up somehow with the back to school nights and in the era of coronavirus. Maybe there's room for more parent conversations in other ways than face to face. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the school committee? You know, it feels to me like um, we just focused a, a lot on secondary school. So I just wanted to see if Principal Valancourt or Dr. Provost wanted to add anything. I don't want to move on too quick if <laughs> you want to respond to anything or feel it's okay just to move on is fine as well. Okay. Um, so the third question. Okay. The third Excuse me, Member Coffin. I think. Principal Valancourt was coming forward to answer the, to respond to that <laughs> invitation. Yeah, I, I apologize. I don't want to put you on the spot, Principal Valancourt. I just felt like we just talked about the high school and I thought I saw your head nodding a couple of times. So I just want to give you a chance to respond if you felt the need or desire to do so. I really appreciate that. And in the district review, I didn't really interpret it as um, negative. And like Dr. Provost, I agreed with all of the findings. I believe that engagement and um, common assessments are incredibly important. And I, you know, when reviewing this with my, with the teachers of Northampton High School, they also agree that this is the work that we have to do. And so um, knowing that we're all on the same page feels really, um, it feels important and it feels like a natural next step to where we want to move with our district or with our school in regards to common assessment, um, engaging kids and youth, and you know, just bottom line, I think it's it's important and we're headed in the right direction. Thank you. 
So the third question um, is when thinking about the positive aspects of our education system that we need to maintain and or strengthen, what are your most important takeaways? And uh, again, Dr. Provost, who did you have in mind to respond? I would yield to Principal Agna. Thank you, Principal Agna. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this one. Um, I have a few thoughts. I won't repeat some of the things that have already been noted because it's, there is some overlap here, but I also wanted to acknowledge the work that Nancy Cheevers has overseen around developing a K-12, pre-K-12 curriculum, which has been something that has been, I know, a struggle in terms of organizing it and also the scope of it, but in the uh, long time that I've been in this district, it, it's a long time coming. I, I don't think we've had this kind of curriculum to operate from really since I've been here. So I wanna acknowledge that work that Nancy has done and everybody who's put together all that work. So that's an important takeaway for me as a positive aspect of the look and that it needs to be updated in, in terms of what the district review did acknowledge. Um, one of the things that they talked about, and as others have talked about, is the coaching model. And I just wanted to add to that, that there have been successes in the coaching model. And, you know, we're still, it's a work in progress um, in terms of how a, one person can work with a variety of teachers and various, various skills and experiences. And that adding a, a social emotional coach, as well as the PD that we're going to be doing, you're going to be doing, with uh, Lourdes Alvarez Ortiz, I think will add to that kind of um, model that has been successful and will be so critical when school reopens and the support that's going to be needed for the teachers in the so social emotional learning as well as the students. Um, I also, it's not noted in here, but I think the SEL coach and the family engagement coordinator both came out of our discussions at ALT around what is needed in the district. And I think when we hear the word equity tossed around a lot, I think the, the hope I would have about the family engagement coordinator especially will be to support the communication between families who are often underrepresented and need to have a voice in their kids' education and don't have a typical way of doing that in the, the mainstream. I wanted to also echo what um, in relation, I mean, Member Levy said it. about the assessments the and the formative the assessments. This, we decided I'm particularly we the work the happy I'm about that and Eddie happy Ellis that it's happening some of the work at the work. elementary level because I do feel that that's a very valid way to assess student progress and it also provides information for teachers for instruction. Um, so I, I think that that is gratifying to see that it's pointed out that the elementary schools have done that, but I don't think we would say as my, my colleagues at the elementary level that we've perfected that for sure. And um, I do think that one of the reasons we've really looked at that has been the fact that we've had that inclusion model for the last three years, Hello. I guess. And it was really critical that we have a different way of measuring Vice President of Employment. growth and progress for students since we are having more diverse classrooms. Um, but I, I do want to acknowledge, and in, in my takeaways uh, uh, would be that we have to keep at that because I still have concerns about how we, we all of us, are able to understand how children learn and what they have learned and what they can apply. And there are just so many ways we need to assess that and we need to keep honing our skills in doing that because I think that that's where the gaps really start to happen for our students tremendously that we don't always recognize what they know and, and how they are able to apply their knowledge. And I think that that's come up for me a lot in this last few months of this um, remote learning is that we've seen a lot of learning going on that wouldn't typically happen in a classroom or wouldn't typically be noted as part of learning. And so I think we can learn from that as far as looking at what experiences children have had and also the way that we can assess that. 
And I just would like to also say that I think that we do have to keep looking at student engagement and it's going to be so critical that we pay attention to when they come back from this and however format school looks that the, the gap is going to be wider. There's no question about it because we know from all our experiences and all the research that students, um, families have such a big role in helping their, their children learn and the experiences that they can provide them. And we know that families' homes have been very, very different in terms of their ability to support the kind of learning going on in the homes. So the part that we're going to be looking at very, very clearly and closely will be how to assess where students are when they come back. And that's been something that we've talked a lot about in ALT. And I'm really excited that people are paying attention to the different ways that we need to measure what students have learned and where they are in their learning after such a long period of time not being in school. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I mean, I think you're you're um, one of the things that Dr. Provost and I have talked about is how to how to make sense of a of a report that was written, obviously before the virus, before this scenario. And I think what you've presented is one of these aspects of strength of our assessment system. But now there's a new angle to it. A very important angle is, um, a com you know, trying to assess kids' learning loss as well as maybe new new types of assessments for when they return above and beyond the academics, so. There, yeah. There's one other thing I wanted to say too, sorry, was that kind of tying together that social emotional coach or that approach that we're going to be looking at when students return, that we really need to balance how much we wanna assess their learning academically with where they are socially and emotionally given what's happened to them. So I know that everybody's looking at that and I, I trust that our, our educators are going to be really tuned into that, but I just hope that we can acknowledge that students are going to need that kind of support. Maybe at the same time as they, we need to know what they've learned, quote, in academics, but we need to really, really hold them and heal them. Thank you. Um, school committee members want to respond to this question about aspects that we need to maintain or strengthen. Member Gold? Um, yeah, just checking. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I think, you know, one of the strengths that um, they did share was the coaching, and as many people identified as well. And being a, being a coach, um, I certainly can know and understand the daunting task the coaches have of being shared amongst four schools, um, you know, with four different, you know, as, as much as there is. Um, commonality amongst the school. There's also differences in what's going on and what each school needs. And so um, figuring out, a, you know, keeping in, keeping in mind that um, it's certainly something that I can imagine needing to continue to grow and strengthen, whether it's at some point over the next couple of years, addressing additional coaches, because um, I, I can, it's, it seems certainly like a daunting task also than needing that at the secondary level. And so you know, building on the successes they were showing by seeing how can we expand that. Um, and then at the same time, um, the curriculum development that that's finally ha that has that has happened that they were uh, has been finalized. Um, now it seems like there's that piece. How do you strengthen that through professional development? Um, the uh, they pointed to the strength of the teacher leaders, and that takes time. Just knowing as a teacher um, how much time it takes, and so having the time during the academic year and in school day to really embed that that role of professional development and using curriculum effectively um, is is huge and so I think that those those pieces now can be strengthened both through expanding the coaching model and strengthening um, professional development thank you member gold Um, I'll just add for myself that, you know, this, this review, as I said earlier, did not look at leadership and governance. If it had, it would have um, been much 
it, it, it would have involved more visits to City Hall and um, discussions with the budget director and, and others. But I will say there was one small piece of the report that I picked up on, and it said that interactions with the city are constructive, facilitated because the mayor is the chair of the school committee. Um, I, I, that I, think it's, I think it's because a lot more than that. And, I, and I'll just say that this is something that uh, we can't take for granted. It's, I have an opportunity to do these reviews and to visit schools throughout the year. And it's so clear and obvious when, um, when that relationship is not positive. What you hear quite clearly is schools kind of blaming central office or blaming the superintendent or blaming the school committee who in turn blame the state or blame the city or blame the, the city council. And um, it's kind of a bad culture. It, it, it stems down in many different levels and it really hurts the culture in many ways. I don't have the opportunity to go into our Northampton city, city um, offices any more than anybody else. But I would say the relationship between the city uh, the mayor, the city council, the school committee, and the superintendent is quite positive, and that makes a substantial difference when it gets to funding, when it gets to prioritizing, and when it gets to just communicating what's happening in our schools and how much of a city we prioritize our education. So for that, I just wanted to say that I wanted, that struck me as the highest thing of maintaining and strengthening. I don't think we could, um, we, we can't emphasize the importance of that enough. So. Thank you for who's participating in those aspects of it. And I see member Goldman's hand is raised, so. Thank Please you. Share. Yes, um, I've agreed with many of the items that have already been listed. Those are also um, important things to point out for me with the past questions. With this question, um, I also, um, Something that's really important for me to maintain and strengthen is our relationships. And, um, and so, for example, I, I'm very interested, I'm so proud of the curriculum and the work that's been done um, for the district. And I really want to keep providing support for that to um, sort of, um, I don't know exactly what the word is. Um, to really just really like bake in so completely and start um, to, to bring about supporting our students. I also think that that's a tremendous support for um, students that are in need of more support that have been at those populations that have been identified and that it actually will support and create harmony and relationships among students and in classes. Um, and also provide a chance for a lot of evolution of the curriculum um, that makes us a great school with uh, great teachers. And um, so, so that interest in maintaining and strengthening and why I'm really excited also about the family engagement coordinator is a chance for the relationship building with the alt team and the admins and the school committee families and the you know the teachers and NACE and um, and also the student population really looking for everyone to have a voice and um, making sure that information is available and there are opportunities for questions and understanding um, this conversation here I think is a perfect example of that so just really appreciate everyone um, showing up and contributing and taking the time to review you know understand the review and bring your questions and comments. Um, and I also just wanna say, in, um, in addition, sort of aligned with what I'm saying is that I, I just really miss being with all of you um, together in person. And it, this is amazing technology and I'm, uh, ha this is hard work and I just find it so much harder to do uh, when we're not in person connecting. And so uh, really looking forward to the next opportunity to, to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Goldman. Um, I don't see anybody else's hands raised and I think we're at halfway officially, maybe more than halfway after the intro of this process. Did anybody, is this working for folks? Did anybody else, did anybody have any quick ideas to share that maybe would, um, that they wanna see me incorporate into this aspect of the meeting? or should we continue as is? I'm finding this nice. 
I'm finding this sort of informal but important conversation to be helpful, but. Member Seraphie Cox has her hand raised. Yep. Miss, um, uh, yeah, I see it now. Yep, Member Seraphie Cox. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I do uh, uh, like the, uh, uh, as you said, I think informal uh, back and forth. I also wondered if there, since this is a item on the agenda, there will be an opportunity for public comment, I assume. um tonight uh an, I, an opportunity for the public to comment on this particular agenda item public comment is for items that are not on the agenda but that the public wants to talk to us about but then they can talk to us about each individual item with my understanding and so i'm wanting to confirm that that is true hmm. um I would, I mean, typically if we're holding a public hearing on something, that would be the case. Um, I don't know that we incorporate, we did, I, I, I came late, so I don't know, do we have public comment at the beginning of the meeting? Did, were there members of the public who offered public comment? Um, that wasn't really how we structured this special meeting because it's supposed to be sort of a workshop style. So um, I, don't, I don't know, it's not, it's not how we posted the agenda because it wasn't really for our student, um, success meetings uh it was really an opportunity for the school committee to do kind of a deep dive on on an issue so that's my response dr provost i just wanted to say that we did have public comment at the beginning of this meeting and also i will i will just check with the, the chair and the vice chair but my my belief is that the tradition of public comment has been not to to restrict or censor public comment to what's on the agenda for that evening so if at a subsequent meeting members of the public wanted to react to what they heard tonight i think that would be allowed most definitely okay um member Sophie cox are you are, are you okay with us moving forward Yes, I'm, I'm okay. I'm just also, uh, perhaps it's also my um, difference of, of experience with different um, types of bodies. So I misunderstood the way that public comment is taken, um, but in other public bodies that I've been to, they have public comment on each agenda item. So you can like put all of your thoughts together at one time. Um, and so I apologize that 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 I misunderstood that. But part of the reason for my thoughts on that is that I recognize that, you know, the, the school committee is an important voice in this process and the alt team is a very important voice in this process. Um, and, uh, and teachers have been referenced but are not speaking themselves. Um, staff members have been referenced but are not speaking themselves. So I just uh, wanted the opportunity um, to, to hear those voices in case that was uh, something that, that um, and I don't know that it is. <laughs> I, I just uh, often want to make sure that that opportunity is there for, uh, for members who are, sorry, members of the public who are not a part of this committee to, uh, to speak. Um, Member Voss. Thank you. I was I was gonna say something along these lines at the end, but since Member Seraphie Cox said it now, I think it's appropriate to just say um, I think this is a great conversation. I'm excited for the second half of it, and this is such a valuable document. And it's we're talking about it because it's going to help us think about our new district improvement plan, and this is huge. So. I, what I was going to propose at the end, but I'll just say now is I would really like us to consider this not the end of this conversation. We need to get input from a broader group of people. Um, all team members were invited to contribute tonight and I'm finding that really helpful, but I also know that I would find it equally helpful to hear from teachers and other NACE members on this topic. So 
moving in, moving ahead as we go about using this document and what's coming out of it, I just hope we find space to hear from a broader range, including the, that group and the public. Thank you. So why don't we move on then to question number four, which is when thinking about where we need to improve as a school district, what are your most important takeaways, areas of improvement? Um, Dr. Provost, who was gonna address this issue for the all team? And we will have Dave Messing respond to this question. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and in the interest in getting other, you know, other input, I'll try and keep my comments brief. Uh, a lot of this by this point in the evening has already come up. So some of these themes again overlap and certainly with regard to even the um, just the standards that were covered in this review i think we will note that there are some things that impact um, some of our population of our school community differently but findings of the district review indicate that progress has been made over the last five years on areas identified and targeted in the previous district improvement plan and that further work in some of these areas remains uh, some of the most important takeaways are the contributing factors present that inhibit the achievement of all students the review highlights inconsistencies and in lessons across the district in supporting students' varied learning needs, which we know impacts our student population differently and our most vulnerable students most severely. We know many of our English learners, Hispanic and Latino students and less affluent students progress and achieve to a significantly lower degree than their counterparts. Um, while insufficient data use and a lack of support structures for struggling students were noted at the high school in the review specifically, the need for increased systems of support was a broader theme that emerged. The review identified the need for systems of support for all students and the need to improve culturally sensitive and responsive approaches to build collaborative relationships. Key to this goal was the development of, uh, quote, broad-based reciprocal relationships between schools and families, as well as enhancing the diversity of partnerships during decision-making and program design and evaluation. Some parents reported that even as members of the I school council- I thought the awesome. strawberry pool. They didn't feel welcome to discuss uh, decision making. Some parents reported that even as members of a school council, they didn't feel welcome to discuss some issues central to teaching and learning. Uh, this is an area that's important in our improvement as a school district. Um, perhaps summing it up most concisely, the review states systemic and cultural barriers in recent years continue to interfere with the district's ability to ensure access, equity, and engagement along the K through 12 continuum. Well, this phrase read heavily in January, its weight feels profoundly greater tonight. A focus on these structural and cultural barriers at all levels of our school community and across levels of analysis from classroom to building to district is of the utmost importance as we look at drafting a plan for improvement. Affecting positive change within our sphere of influence, prioritizing those least well served is arguably the most important takeaway from the review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Member Fallon? Sorry, Member Fallon? Yeah, um, so I actually, I appreciate what Mr. Messing had to say. I, that's to me, um, my, one of my most important takeaways is the, the discussion given to um, equity access, uh, structural impediments in this document. And um, one thing we haven't talked about is the recommendation for us to construct a series of the expedited listening sessions with Northampton students. I think that even the use of word expedited shows just how important they think this is um, and that we should pay particular attention to the culture of the school environment diversity and inclusion, curriculum instruction, assessment and support services. Um, I would love it if we went even further. Um, and as part of the district review process, we um, made an equity mission statement sort of central to this that our mission is to end the predictive value of social, cultural, racial factors on student success um, and had an anti-racist policy statement included. Um, I would also, I would like us to go beyond this and, and look at the code of conduct, particularly the section on the dress code. Um, and in addition to scrutinizing attendance and the suspension data that DESE provides, that I think we also need to, to look at how detention is assigned, why, to whom, uh, particularly at the middle school and what students are asked to do during a detention. And then finally, I've mentioned it before, and I'll probably keep mentioning it. I think it's really important that we examine our district's grading system. 
um, that for students and families, grades determine course placement, athletic and extracurricular act eligibility, employment possibilities, college admissions, and financial aid. Um, they shape students' identities as learners and their life trajectories. And unfortunately, a lot of the common grading practices that we use, they perpetuate achievement gaps. They reinforce the differences in family resources and support based on students' race and income. So like examples would be the use of participation or, or effort grades. I, those are not equitable practices. The calculation of grades based on averages, the assignment of extra credit. Um, I think that by failing to examine or even have this discussion that we may be unwittingly contributing to this achievement gap in our district. And so I love the focus that um, the district review brought to it. And I would love the focus to be on examining these um, systemic barriers, this institutional racism that exists. But I think that we need to go beyond what's mentioned in the district review. Um, when we're looking at those um, structural barriers. Thank you, Member Fallon. And I see Member Levy Sanders raised. Thanks. Uh, okay, well, between Mr. Messing and Member Fallon, they've taken a lot of what I was gonna say and said it very eloquently. So I will simply add, and I'll say that I, um, I was, I was struggling whether to talk about this right now in response to this question or in response to the question about um, embarking on a new district improvement plan, what are the core themes, findings, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think I, I, will, I will simply add um, a list of, of, or to the list of what member Fallon and Mr. Messing have already articulated. Um, I think there needs to be in our, in our next district improvement plan and an entire broad focus on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion that in addition to what's been mentioned includes um, anti-bias work that's not just a one-off workshop, culturally responsive pedagogy and practices, student programming at all levels on identity and inclusion from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. And this can um, include train the trainer models, um, but again, ensuring that that identity and equity are, are a part of the intentional curriculum. Um, a study of access to, into the honors and AP courses at the high school, um, and also uh, that, that both assesses and addresses the barriers. Um, assessments, uh, again, I, I think the rest has been mentioned that I was gonna say, but I think there's a real opportunity here to have a very broad and concerted focus on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm excited for the opportunity to really focus on it. Um, and as Mr. Messing really eloquently said, uh, given the, the current times, I think it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a real necessity. Thank you, Member Levy. Other um, school committee responses to question four? I see member Voss. Just that I fully support what my colleagues have said and thank you for saying it so well. <laughs> uh, member Gold. Yeah, I think something I wanted to add um, while um, agreeing with everything that was said is um, there was great emphasis placed on the uh, consistencies across uh, the elementary schools and um, I th you know, in terms of instructional practices and coherence, and um, that is awesome to see. I think at the same time, uh, you know, when looking at the, the data, it's important to see the unique needs of each school and that um, not to, um, you know, not to think that, that we don't need to con continue to look at that in terms of where equity is in terms of investments of, of supports uh, for each of the schools, because each school has a, you know, clearly has a unique um, data set when it comes to um, academics and, and there needs to certainly be some differentiation within that. And so um, making sure that's emphasized as well moving forward. Member Levy. 
not member leaving. Okay. Yes. Um, no, I, sorry. I lowered my hand before I unmuted myself. I realized I needed to unmute myself and then lower my hand. Sorry. Okay. I do want to add, uh, I wanted to, to first start by talking about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there are a few other things that really struck me um, in terms of, of some of the most important takeaways. And those are, you know, we, we talked about the the strength of assessments, even if there's there's room for growth in the elementary schools, um, but really thinking about the work in the middle school and the high school to ensure that our lessons are varied to support all learners and that we have really strong ways of assessing, um, of having um, metrics to to really measure progress towards attainable goals. And then the, the other thing that I think has, it needs to be said that has come up in other conversations um, is really the, the notion of professional development and how important it is to have really impactful, engaging professional development that's not workshops where people are talked at, um, but that is, um, is really going to help us move forward in terms of the goals that are articulated. And that is gonna mean a real partnership with NACE to increase the opportunities for professional development that we're able to provide teachers. And I don't know what the process is for that since we're not negotiating a new contract for a little while, but I think it's gotta stay on the forefront of our conversation. It's really hard to accomplish a lot of what we've talked about when we can't engage our teachers in, in meaningful professional development across the board. And I know that I, I think in the meantime, maybe we need to talk about creative ways to do so. Thank you very much, Member Levy. Uh, personally, I had um, many of the same thoughts. So um, I really appreciate how people articulated those. And I'm, I'll say I'm super excited that there doesn't seem to be much pushback or defensiveness on the part of the district or all team members. I mean, if this is if some of these areas of challenge are well known and we as a school committee can um, do what we need to and what we can do to support some of these areas of growth, then it feels just really exciting to me. It, it's, it's just a much, much different sort of atmosphere than trying to get people to take what could be perceived as criticism seriously. And I'm not hearing any of that. And I think uh, every comment from, an, from the all team and Dr. Provost to now has been really rewarding and, and nice to hear. And I think um, as we now move into the final two questions, I think we're now gonna really dig into our priorities and what we think needs to happen moving forward. So I, I greatly look forward to some of these ideas. And I, I would ask um, our clerk to maybe if necessary for this aspect of the meeting to, to take some diligent notes if there are a list of priorities or if there's sp specific things that we really highly value, it might be worth keeping a separate list of these that we could respond to in the future. So um, as we move into the next, the final two questions, these were, these were, um, these were generated to do some future, to, to think about the future. So the first had to do with um, an agenda item, which will come up, I think later on tonight, which is the development of the new district improvement plan. And the question that we have for tonight is what are the core themes and findings from this review that we need to ensure are reflected in the goals and the strategies of our new DIP? And to begin with again, um, Dr. Provost. And so with that set up as these being really some of the most critical questions tonight, I'm happy to say, that we've saved some very strong administrators for the end. And so to address this question, I would turn to Principal Madden. Okay, Principal Madden. Um, it's interesting though, because I feel like I don't have a whole lot more to add. I feel like a lot of the themes have been discussed. So I feel like there has been a, a lot of overlap. I don't wanna spend a lot of time repeating what I think has been articulated very well among all of us. Um, I think that the district review and our current data certainly shows that we are not always serving all of our students well. Um, we've got gaps for certain groups of our population that are probably going to be widened because of this coronavirus and the school closure, um, but we have shown growth in areas of assessment and student support. So I think that we need to expand on those positives um, and, and grow where we know we can in terms of supporting all of our students in the areas that we've already discussed tonight. Uh, I don't, 
Um, I feel like we've done a really good job pulling out of the district review all of the things that we need to be working on and all the things that uh, we can expand upon because we're doing quite well. Thank you. Um, and how about from the school committee? Member Levy. Uh, I'm I'm recognizing that I feel like my voice has been heard a lot in this meeting, so I will I will just really briefly say, I I will also echo what um, Principal Madden just said that a lot of what we what we really need to focus on has been said. But I heard you, Member um, Kaufman, say that we're taking diligent notes during this part of it. So I guess I just want to reiterate the piece about um, really ensuring that we have um, that, that we have a very broad and um, a broad focus on diversity, equity and inclusion moving forward. So, so that that gets written in the really careful notes part. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Miss uh, Member Bozanski, sorry. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate here. I'm going to try and put on my video. I'm having some internet problems, so hopefully I won't freeze. Um, but I appreciate what everyone has said so far. And I really, uh, I think that a lot of the important issues have been highlighted and everyone spoke very eloquently to it. So I won't repeat that, but I do just want to um, throw back in there when we're thinking about what we need to focus on is that it does feel like the reviewers did put this emphasis um, and even on page 41, they highlighted the district does not have a fully developed comprehensive consistent system of support to meet the needs of all its learners. And they talk a lot about this um, inconsistency and in sort of engaging students, engaging practice. And I just think when we're looking forward and looking at the district improvement plan, um, that sort of lead into it and making sure that we're paying attention to that because it does seem to me that in their review they uh, did find that it was um, uneven from classroom to classroom and so I think that's an important thing and what I've been hearing is that the all team and superintendent all recognize um, all of the great strengths that the district review pointed out, but also uh, what needs work, including this. So that was good. But I just didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle because I know there have been so many other important issues that have been brought up. So that's all. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. I'm going to add uh, a few things myself. I'm sorry, uh, Member Go. You can go first. You go for it. Oh, okay. Um, for myself, um, I want to, I, I think I'm saying something very similar to what Member Bizanski had brought up, but I do think um, just an aspect of the, of the system, of the K-12 system of social emotional uh, support for kids, um, it again does seem to be somewhat scattershot, scattershot and strong in some, le some levels than others, and I think a comprehensive well articulated K-12 system of which we probably have some good pieces in place already would just be very beneficial in terms of transition. I think the hiring of a um, SE coach is gonna hopefully be, be very helpful in that area, but I just wanna reiterate that aspect of the report. Um, I think another area that we just need, I mean, just to put it in a nutshell, is that it, we, we definitely wanna, I think, support more high quality instruction that engages, challenges, and supports all students, especially at the secondary level. That was seen throughout the report and mentioned throughout the report. And it got me wondering, um, you know, do we have structures in place um, to observe teachers at the middle school and high school? And, and how do teachers know if they can improve their instruction or not? Are there adequate systems of support in place for them to get the feedback that they need? And the report itself raises this question and shares several ideas. And again, I would certainly more than welcome the opportunity for the school committee to support that. But I see that as a, a tremendous thing that we would uh, a need that was highlighted. And um, we need to probably make some systemic changes and allocation of resources to get that going because we might have had stronger systems in the past, but they don't seem to be as 
well structured in the secondary, le secondary level as they, I think, used to be. Um, an underlining thing that member Gold brought up before, but I just want to express it more concretely, is that the, dis the, the report brings up in various places that, um, that we need to ensure that we include ways in which we will measure and monitor our progress and our success. Um, as examples, they brought up that the district does not have formal metrics by which it measures student growth or student success. And in the current dip, um, it states that relationships with families are designed to build and, main and maintain, build and maintain trust between teachers and families. But the plan itself does not have any processes to track feasibility or implementation or a timeline uh, or sustainability. Um, strategies or assessment of the efficacy of this goal. So this seems like we have a lot of uh, spirit behind uh, continuing this. Uh, Principal uh, Agna brought this up before. I know we just supported what might amount to as a, you know, a pretty substantial new administrative position. And I would I really think that what we need to do is just expect from this person or from this effort an, an immediate sort of plan that has embedded within it what are we hoping to gain? How long is it going to take to get there? What are we shooting for in terms of measuring success and what kind of resources it's going to need? Because the intention was always great, but just again, as an example, the previous dip had a, had a, a similar sort of goal, but I don't know if it was successful or not. Nobody does outside of their personal opinion. So I think the report itself uh, reflected in several ways that we need to come up with metrics. Um, and it said flat out, our current district and most school improvement plans include goals to use um, assessment data. They include goals to use assessment data to monitor student progress and ensure instructional supports and challenges for all students. But nevertheless, the DIP and the SIPs do not use metrics to measure progress towards attainment of these goals. So once again, the intention is great. The goals are great, but we don't, uh, we don't. We haven't figured out a way to measure those, and um, we definitely will need to include those in the next in the next one. Thank you. I see. Um, I see member member Gold. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just very briefly, and you kind of touched on it. I think um, when you were talking about the assessments and all that, they it relates to the dip, but not directly to the content of it, but more the Maybe it is the content, but um, the report talked about the need for the form, expanding the formal assessments um, from the, that are in the elementary to secondary, and along those lines, like expanding the use of data points and growth points and formal assessments to the development of the dip, and including those, you know, having certain data points included, you know, in each of the goals when the dip is developed, you know, along with sort of, um, you know, I know. Uh, Principal Shaked and the school council at Bridge Street did, uh, added a rubric to their, um, we, we added a rubric to the school uh, school improvement plan. And so having that piece also in the district improvement plan with some you know specific uh, data indicators would be beneficial. Thank you. And uh, Member Voss? Yeah, one thing I wanna add that we haven't talked about yet that they mentioned, in, I, I think should be part of our at least goal for the process of writing the district improvement plan is connections with families. And I'll just read a few sentences right on page two in the executive summary. At the top, parents interviewed for this report reported feeling estranged from engaging in decision-making processes. Some parents who serve on school council reported not feeling welcome to discuss issues related to class size, staffing formulas, and the curriculum. Um, in addition, dot, 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 uh, our previous district improvement plan states that relationships with families are designed to build and maintain trust between teachers and families. The plan does not have any processes to track feasibility, implementation, and timeline, sustainability, and assessment of the efficacy efficacy of the goal. And I, I think that's a really important goal. And I'd like to see us do better with it and involve, find ways to involve this really important part of our community and more conversations, both family teacher relationships and this kind of conversation we're having now, how do we get 
a broader range of input. And somewhere in this report, it actually talks very specifically, I'm not gonna be able to point to the page number, about the importance of bringing in more voices, not the ones that we're always hearing, but ones from various underrepresented groups and um, students, high school students, and asking them about their experience through our schools. And I think we could learn a lot if we followed some of the advice in this report along those lines. Thank you, Member Voss. Um... And I don't see any other hands raised. So um, we'll move into the final question. And I'll just say that at the end of this question, um, maybe we'll just ask for final thoughts, uh, takeaways, summary, um, reflections. And I would like to include any and all, all team members if they're interested in participating in that sort of thing. So just to set the stage for what will happen after our final question, which is, Given how much is unknown at this time, which findings and or overarching themes reflected in the report will be particularly helpful as we continue to plan for the future? Dr. Provost? And I would invite Principal Wilson to respond to this. Thank you, Principal Wilson? Yes, and uh, thank you for um, all of this conversation. I, I think the one thing that we can all um, really be um, grateful for is um, the honest conversation that we're having about our areas of strength and challenge and our true goal of supporting all of our students. And that has really been reflected tonight uh, in the discussions that we're having and the focus on um, our district improvement plan and the district review. So I, I just wanted to um, share that what we know is that our priority um, during this very difficult time uh, needs to remain to uh, uh, the connections we have with our students and our families and um, as well engaging students in their learning. Um, what we also know that the closure you know has the potential to widen the gaps and create gaps for more students and um, I'd like to say that you know, there's, um, for this question, there's not a lot more to add um, than has been discussed and, and um, really presented so well. Um, I, I feel like we should um, really focus on the assessment piece in knowing that there are going to be increased gaps for many students and the district review identified assessment practices and improvement of using data to identify and support students and monitor our most at-risk students. I think that's something that we um, are planning to and really need to focus on. So looking at assessment and, um, and analyzing the data to identify areas for targeted intervention for students um, and uh, skill development and identifying the gaps that um, were previously there but who, that have also likely been widened and created for more students. Um, and as Gwen said, it'll be really criti critical um, to use our social emotional um, screenings as well and to support our students um, and our families as best we can. Um, in focusing on the um, findings and the themes identified um, in the dist district review and in the development of the district improvement plan, um, it's really essential that we focus our efforts on equitable access to learning for all of our students, um, student engagement with the learning, um, cultural competence, homeschool partnerships, and professional development. Um, and also to continue the progress that we've made um, with curriculum and assessment. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, it has been shared that um, there have been some successes with the initiatives uh, around coaching and curriculum and assessment uh, at the elementary schools and um, the support of the district um, and the all team is really essential um, in moving this work forward to the secondary schools. Um, there's much happening at the secondary level, um, but uh, we can also use uh, what the practice has been at the elementary schools uh, to strengthen what we're doing. So um, I think that's what we would like to share around moving forward and developing our DIP as our areas of focus and the themes that we really need um, to be central to the work we're doing. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Principal Wilson. We appreciate your insights. Um, who from the uh, school committee would like to 
Sure. Okay, seeing no hands go up, I had um, a couple of things I can share. Um, I wanted to share at least. One of, the, one of the areas that I picked up on the report that I think is very prevalent considering what we're going through now is it said, while collaboration and inclusion in decision-making are valued in the district, there are gaps in communication exasperated by different approaches by teachers and leaders in each school. Um, I kind of feel like this is inevitable, but at the same time, I can't think of a more important time that communication is clear that district school and teacher leaders and other leaders are on the same page or at least have their have their thoughts and their uh, opinions valued so um things are kind of in a earth-shaking moment at this point and going back to school is going to look very differently no matter when that happens and in what form so i just wanted to say if this if the review already saw some gaps in communication ex exasperated by different approaches to that um, by teachers and leaders that we can't ever really do enough to kind of bring that together and hopefully everybody could have um, their voices heard and their their opinions at least the opportunity for their opinions to be expressed but it, it did strike me as something that we probably more than ever need to focus on um, another area i wanted to bring up is that while all the elementary school findings in the report i think are um, consistently positive and certainly more positive than some of the findings in secondary schools. Uh, it is also true that our student outcomes are uneven at our elementary schools. Um, the, the review didn't look at the separate elementary schools per se. Um, they looked at all the elementary schools together. So in past student success meetings, we rally, we actually dug pretty closely into uh, looking at student and school accountability data and the differences across our schools and our subpopulations across within our schools and across the district. And I, I think as part of the next dip and where we are now is we really need to uncover why and we need to continue to focus on balancing our outcomes across the schools, whether it's, um, I don't know the reasons why, but whether it's a, uh, a leadership style or it's a nature or sub subgroups of the kids that are attending the schools, whether it's the uh, professional development that's been offered, whether the resources have been uh, uneven and not appropriate. I, I think any and all of these things could be contributing to it, but I don't think we can go on much further with the outcomes, the differing outcomes that we have across the four elementary schools. And I think that I don't want that to be washed away in the report because it overall was positive, but looking at the data more closely, it, it's just uneven across the four schools. And we've discussed this many times in the past and we need to do something about it whatever can be done. Any other comments on this final question? Nothing, uh, member leaving? Dr. Provost? So I just want to say that there are many administrators who um, didn't have an opportunity to speak tonight and uh, when we, you were queuing up those last two questions, I, I made a comment about uh, having some very strong administrators to respond to the last two questions. I didn't want that to be misinterpreted by any member of my team. Certainly those who spoke first are just as um, strong as those who spoke at the end, and those who didn't speak at all um, also are very strong and valued members of the team. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Thank you, Dr. Provo. So um, as I said before, I'd like to just finish this part of tonight's meeting by just asking if there's any final thoughts, comments, big picture, small picture, anything anybody want to summarize tonight's uh, discussion with next steps and uh, would open this up to anybody, uh, including uh, school committee members, all team members, specifically, I should say, not to anybody, but any members of the all team or school committee. Member Voss. Um, I really appreciate the conversation and this document and all the work that went into it, both while they visited and, and getting ready for the conversation. Um, there's a lot there and I just want to encourage us to not view this as, okay, we talked about it. We crossed it off the list because I think I'm going to 
come back and say, oh, I wish I would have talked more about X, Y, or Z. And that leads into what I said earlier. I think this is an ongoing conversation and um, we really want to use all the information we can. And this is an important part of it for the district improvement plan. And I really do hope we make time to hear from the alt team again, but also from teachers, NACE members who are teachers, who aren't teachers, parents, et cetera, because there's this is a really important piece of what we're going to do this year. And, and, and I guess my big picture is I have not fully digested this. I, I, I don't want to leave here feeling like, OK, we talked about it. We're done. Everything's been said. Um, I want to feel like we can come back to it. Thank you. And uh, Member Buzanski? Hi, thanks. I appreciate what uh, Member Voss just said. I just also want to add, I think it's, I know it's a really um, challenging time to try and find time and space to even focus on things outside of what's happening with the uh, shutdown and pandemic and what's happening in our in our country right now and everything. So I do really appreciate us carving out this time and having this time to discuss the district review in so many ways, even though I guess it's 16 months old, is that when the review took place? It's actually so relevant in so many ways. I mean, yes, uh, you know, kudos for getting the curriculum uh, done, but so there's so much rich information in here. And it's such a perfect implement um, or instrument to create our district improvement plan from. So I am kind of hoping that, um, Sorry, this is for you, Annie, but um, I am hoping and maybe not in the minutes form, but we could just get kind of a really good list of sort of the everything that was mentioned by folks that we um, our strengths and what we need to work on, because I think that would be really useful. And it, maybe that would be in a format different than the minutes, because I don't want to bog you down on that. But um, and I know we have a district improvement plan kind of committee in place to work on all of this. But, um, and again, back to what member Voss said, I think it is really important to look back at through the district review. They just talk about so many important things that we could and should be working on and the all team uh, to hear that, you know, you weren't surprised by any of it and you agree with it is just great. I think it just kind of sets us up and puts in us in a perfect position to try to move forward and tackle some of these things, so. I appreciate the conversation a lot, and I hope it can just really feed nicely into the district improvement plan and our goals moving forward. Uh, Dr. Chevers? You're muted, Dr. Chevers. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to um, thank everyone for the very kind words about curriculum, but I also very much appreciated that we all do agree on you know the blueprint on the bedrock of the curriculum and how it is re so related to equity and inclusion i mean it's it's just the curriculum is a dynamic and important thing to keep on developing and working on and the relationship between professional development and curriculum the relationship between assessments and curriculum and then all of the different kinds of assessments, the assessments that we do in units and in courses, and then the broader, more normed-based assessments that we do, and how all of these things inform the curriculum. And I was just so happy and so glad to see that people are really invested in keeping the curriculum alive. Um, I've had many experiences in districts where the curriculum is written, it's done, it's over, that's it. You know, and I'm so glad to hear everyone um, really embedding all of the other conversations and all of the other work in the curriculum. So that just makes me feel very, very happy. Thank you. You're welcome and thank you. And uh, Principal Chaka. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity uh, for all of us to meet together. Um, tonight and to have um, a really deep conversation about the things that are really important, I believe, to all of us. Um, you know, this is a really challenging time, um, given obviously the pandemic and then everything that we've been seeing going on in our country. 
over the last several days. And I think for as horrific as those things are, it allows us to open doors to become better people and make things better for our students, for our teachers. And um, I think it allows us an opportunity to work better together. And I appreciate um, the comments, especially from member Levy and member Fallon about diversity, equity and inclusion and anti-racism. I think um, we, are, we have a great opportunity here to um, make things better um, for our district. And I just appreciate that time, um, the time that we've had together tonight um, to really focus on what's important. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, with no other hands raised, um, I want to um, thank the mayor for giving me this opportunity to cross uh, my bucket list, the opportunity to chair a meeting, but I'm more than happy to turn the gavel back over to the mayor for the rest of the meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Member Kaufman, and um, and great job. And it was actually appropriate that you chaired this portion of the meeting because you had sort of written the questions that um, that uh, guided uh, the discussion. So thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is an update from Dr. Provost on the district improvement plan. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. I I want to begin where. Um, I want to begin with, with many of the comments that were, were shared in this, this conversation, probably starting with what Member Buzanski said about wanting to make sure that this conversation doesn't end, but it keeps going. Um, that is the work of the district improvement team, um, and I want to tell you uh, where we are with that and how we envision the process moving forward. So. Uh, I'll just share that we've, I've been working behind the scenes to try to get ready to initiate the district improvement planning process for more than a month. As I'm sure you can imagine, it's complicated by the fact that we are not able to be together. Um, however, the, the place I started with was with um, some thought partners who are already working in the district from the Department of Education for the Middle School Sustainable Improvement Plan. Um, we've mentioned it a few times, and just uh, for members of the public who are watching who may not be aware, the middle school is in the middle of a multi-year process for district for school improvement based around the performance of its, a subgroup of students, its English language learners. Um, and so we've had three colleagues from the Department of Ed who've been working closely with us on that that work, uh, Joan Tuttle, Andy Churchill, and Joe Wyman. And so about a month ago, maybe longer than that, I would say maybe closer to two months ago at this point, um, I began conversations with them around the question of could they expand the work they're doing to assist the middle school to assist the entire district with our next district improvement plan? Because one of the things that I've said all along is that improvement at the middle school can't be a project that occurs only in the middle school because the students who are um, experiencing performance problems at the middle school were experiencing performance problems at the elementary schools before they got to the middle school. And um, one of the, I guess I'll say unfair things about the, the current uh, accountability system is it requires a certain number of students in order to form a subgroup. And those students don't um, come together in large enough numbers in order to form a subgroup until they get to the middle school. And then, um, unfortunately, and I think this has to do with some of the systemic barriers we were discussing, many times by the time they get to high school, that group is no longer together in sufficient numbers to form a subgroup. So in, in some ways, it's, it's the middle school that is asked to do the work of improvement, but it really has to be a district-wide effort. And so in that context, I asked if um, they could be of assistance to the district 
in its district improvement plan, if that could fall under their rubric of trying to assist the middle school. And after doing some checking with DESE, I was happy to say that they, um, they, they found that they could do that. And so um, I've been working with them to try to develop sort of a framework to guide the conversations around district improvement. And the overall question that, that I have for this plan is, what does re reopening and recovery look like in the context of the priorities that were identified for, in the district review? Um, and so when you think about the research that's out there, limited as it is, with reopening and recovery, the evidence is that it's a three-year process. And so for that reason, I think the next district improvement plan should be a three-year plan that takes us through the three years of reopening and recovery. Um, and then within that, the shell of that sort of three-year framework, we've, we've identified the Massachusetts tiered system of support as a framework to, to talk about the activities that need to be done in each of the years. Um, so in MTSS, there are three components, social, emotional, behavioral, and academic. And the question within each of those is, what are the things that we need to do for all students? What do we need to do for some students? And what do we need to do for a small group of students in order to have them be successful? social, emotionally, behaviorally, and academically. And so that's the framework that um, I think will be successful for us in developing the next district improvement plan. We can think about what does the, the district review tell us the, about the priorities in each of those three areas? What does it tell us about the students who are likely to be included in the group of all and the group of some? and the group of a few. And um, that sort of all gets overlaid with the research around what you need to do in the first year of a reentry, and then the two years of recovery um, coming out of it. Um, so that is, that's a framework. And then in terms of um, having voices on the, that are representative on the team, um, one of the things that I feel strongly is that Unit A needs to be the largest group. Um, right now, we've been able to identify between eight and 10 Unit A members. The number's not exact because we're still waiting to hear back from some who have, um, have been invited. We have the, our colleagues from DESE. Uh, Member Kaufman has agreed to represent the school committee. We have six parents. And we have intentionally recruited parents from some of our um, most underserved populations, specifically parents from the, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council and the English Learner Advisory Council. We also have a mix of parents from elementary and secondary. And then we have um, six administrators. So um, the, the group is when it was finally formed, going to be somewhere in the mid-20s. Uh, we also have been able to, uh, to identify a facilitator for the conversations. And so uh, I can tell you at this time that Michael Sullivan has agreed to facilitate. Michael is himself a former JFK middle school teacher, and then he was a, a Northampton administrator and he's now a superintendent in another district who's um, about to retire. So um, that doesn't say anything about what the goals or objectives should be. It's just sort of a framework. It's really the work of the groups to identify what those are. But with such strong agreement um, between the school committee and the administrators and has, has been represented, and I think will be the case on the um, teams among the teachers, and parents as well about what some of the um, deficiencies of the district are and places to focus our efforts over the next three years, I think we'll be off to a good start. Um, so my, my hope is to have a first meeting sometime in June and to um, 
continue to work with this group throughout the summer so that we can bring you back a district improvement plan that is also uh, a reopening and recovery plan and can guide our work of getting from the state where we are right now of um, schools shut down and, and growing gaps to schools reopen and closing gaps. Thank you, Superintendent. Are there any questions for the Superintendent about his update on the District Improvement Plan? Member Levy. Thanks for that update. I guess a couple of questions off offhand. Um, are there any members of REAL who are a part of that committee uh, is my first question. And my second question is, um, was there an open call for volunteers or are you, um, are you specifically tapping people on the shoulders? I'm thinking of, uh, again, from an, from an inclusive perspective, the importance of giving people the opportunity to volunteer as opposed to just be tapped from the community. So there, there was an open call. Um, what we had explained to the faculty is and staff is that we wanted to work with members of the reopening committees um, at this point there are i want to say about 50 to 60 members who are working on reopening committees and we explicitly sent in a message that went both from me and i believe from nace that um, this this group would be the group that we look to to draw members from for the for the dip group uh, the reason for that is there's going to be so much overlap between addressing the issues that are in the district review and just the many technical and adaptive challenges of school reopening that we wanted to have people who had um, had that background ready. Um, the other the other piece is that we we knew that there was a, a, a culture already in and norms already established for the groups that were working on the, the problems of reopening. And so we wanted to be able to capitalize on that. Now, obviously, the parents um, are not, have not been a part of that, and the DESE members have not been a part of that. So we have some, um, some new, new people who have not been a part of the process of reopening. But we did, um, we did invite people and did let them know that by signing up for one of the reopening groups, you are sort of increasing your um, increasing your impact, increasing your voice, because then you would have also then have an opportunity to work on the district improvement plan. Um, with respect to your first question about real, I don't believe we have any parents from real at this time. Um, I would just recommend reaching out to them. I think especially given the conversation tonight about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think that would be a voice that we would be remiss to, to include. So I think I, I strongly encourage including somebody from that group. Thank you. I think that's a great suggestion. Member Voss. Sorry. Um, I'll echo the uh, getting a member or more than one member from Rio um, to be included. And I just want, I didn't hear you. you. I think I heard you say you wanted a large um, membership from unit A, but did you say how many out of, there's 20, 20 some members on this team and you said six. Yeah, I said eight members. to 10. Sorry, what? I said eight to 10. Thank you. Our time. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for the superintendent? Uh, Member Kaufman. Thank you. As a co-host, I can't ask, I can't raise my hand. So I'm doing it this way, but Annie, if you could dislodge me as a co-host, that would be appreciated. Um, so Dr. Provost, can you just talk about the, the process a little bit? Like what is the role of the committee and how is the plan generated? How does, how long is it going to take? Have you thought about these aspects, or is that what you're relating or relying on the committee to help you with? Just want to see how much you've thought through the process itself. Sure, happy to talk to that. 
Um, so uh, with Joan and Andy and Joe, we were able to develop a agenda for the first meeting, which we then shared with the facilitator who was uh, brought on board just recently. The general agenda for the first meeting is to review um, the findings of the district review, to focus on what is known about recovery and and reopening. Um, I want to just I'll, I'll share this because it's something that, that's going to be shared with that group that I think will help to put this, the magnitude of the challenge into context for everybody. Um, we'll be sharing a piece of research that was relate that was done um, in the early. Well, it was finalized. It was finalized at, at the end of the last century, but had to do with the ongoing impacts of. Uh, school stoppages in Argentina from the beginning of part of the century. Um, and these were different than ours because these were strikes. They weren't, um, uh, and in, they weren't uh, pandemic related events where they tried to do any kind of remote learning. But for some kids, what we've just experienced and they're currently experiencing is the equivalent of that, right? Because we have students who have been very disengaged um, and that those numbers have grown as time has gone on. And so looking at um, some the Argentinian study, they found that the loss of three or four months of education created a lifelong impact for all those students. It was measurable not only for the rest of their academic career, but it was measurable for the rest of their lives in terms of lost learning. And not only was it measurable for them, but it was detectable in their children as well. So it may actually be a multi-generational effort to try to come back from what's happened during the this, this shutdown. So we'll be sharing that. We'll be sharing um, the results of the district review, as I said, and we'll be giving um, members an opportunity to share some of their perspectives because, you know, whenever we have the opportunity to create space for members of our school community, just creating space for people to talk in a safe way about what their experience has been is, is helpful and therapeutic, I think. And then um, we'll share sort of this goal of a three-year plan saying we have a massive challenge ahead of us and we need to start identifying some priorities to address in the reopening year and in the recovery years and we need you to help us and we, we want to be sure that we're comprehensive enough to be thinking not only of academic needs of students, but also social and emotional needs of students and behavioral needs of students. And then um, try to, at least by the second meeting, have people identify which of those areas they want to work on. Um, and then the, the goal would be to, to divide the entire committee into subgroups that can work on different parts of the plan, and then to report and join back together um, and, and find some high, highly supported, high priority goals that we think will be high impact for students um, to share with the whole team and to be ratified by the whole team so that they can then be brought back to the school committee, hopefully um, with, it, with the intention of having a, a well thought through and, and strong document that we can share with the school committee so that they can adopt it as as their district improvement plan as we move into this this massive challenge that's ahead of us. So I think it's it's a work of um, June and July, possibly part of August as well. I think it, it will be um, mainly done in the form of Zoom meetings. Um, I'm thinking probably four or five meetings and possibly some work by sub teams in between meetings. Um, so it, it it's daunting, but I, I think it's doable, and I think it's important to have it done because we really need to have a strong sense of, of priority as we try to go through reopening. I, I will take this um, opportunity just to talk a little bit, bit about reopening. Um, we, Because I, I had shared with the committee, and I know that many of you are, are hearing from constituents about what could potential scenarios be for reopening. I will be bringing those forward at the June meeting. At this time, from our review of literature, we found about nine potential scenarios for reopening. 
There's one new document that's just come out um, that I need to review. There's a possibility that there may be some more scenarios there. Um, and so I, my, that is, that's just another piece, right? So in the, in the context of figuring all this other stuff out, we have to decide what the picture and the plan for reopening is going to look like. And, and marrying up all of these pieces is, is complex work and it needs to be strategic and it, it really needs to be done during this pause we have before we reopen schools. Okay, well, that, that's a lot of detail. Thank you, Dr. Provost. I, don't, I know that you don't have all the questions answered, but that was very helpful in terms of what your thinking is currently and, and time. Um, and then just to summarize what you're saying about reopening, um, if I understand right, you are continuing to seek input and that's your goal of meeting with um, uh, educators or having the principals meet with educators in their schools to review the upwards of nine different scenarios and you'll get feedback, maybe narrow those down, who knows, uh, change those, re-edit those, and then ultimately you're talking about next week coming to us and presenting to us what? So uh, the number of scenarios, whether it's nine or whether it grows somewhat, I think really should be shared with faculty. Um, when, I, when I share news of this nature, um, although this will be the first time I'm sharing anything of this magnitude, but whenever I share um, big news that could potentially change outcomes for large numbers of people with the school committee or publicly before it's had a chance to be processed and discussed with the employees and faculty, um, that there can be a potential for, um, for some backlash. Not everybody watches school committee meetings, and so some people may get misinformation. Um, for some people, it's jarring to hear things at, at, in the context of a school committee meeting where there's no opportunity to, to ask questions or, or to um, respond. So my goal in sharing that information with the, the faculty is just to, be, to, to buffer them um, from any potential shocks that might come from sharing the scenarios with the school committee. And then my hope is that uh, as a district, we'll be able to narrow down the number of options um, and so, because we need to really be working very soon to schedule classes, to figure out transportation routes. Um, so we're going to have to know what scenario we're working with, I would say, by the end of June at the latest. Yes. Um, so the goal, the goal is really to start the conversation. Um, the Department of Ed will put out some guidance. Maybe it'll be helpful, maybe not. Um, but I would say, hopefully, we will be getting some kind of consensus by the end of June so that we can put together plans to be able to successfully execute a plan when school reopening comes. Thank you. Member Gold, you have your hand up. Um, yes. Um, is my audio coming in OK? Okay, great. Um, so I was just going to ask you, you had said that um, Dr. Provost, the role in the end of the school committee is to adopt the um, district, the district improvement plan. Um, so, and, you know, being on the budget subcommittee, in some ways it seems um, related in some sense where we have that budget subcommittee that reviews it first so that, you know, the greater sub, the greater school committee has um, had some of the team, more of the team members uh, reflecting on it. And so I would just ask if there is room for uh, any other school committee members on it. I mean, as a, I would, I'd love to be a part of that as well. And I think that maybe, you know, since it is something that we're adopting, um, I think it might be helpful. You know, I, I think it's great having uh, member Kaufman on there, but if there was a, a broader base there, it might help him. And as he's communicating back to the school committee about it, because if it, in the end, if it's something that we're adopting, I feel like having a couple more of us on the district improvement plan development team could be helpful. So I, I think that is a question that the committee can answer. Um, I think that having an additional member certainly would work. I think that having um, all of the members or, or even many of the members would be potentially problematic. Not only is there the, the quorum issue, but there is trying to maintain a balance 
and and you know we've intentionally kept some of the groups smaller to to really maintain the primacy of unit a um so but i i guess i would just like sense of direction from the committee if you'd like to have one or more members added member levy um, I'm also interested in being a part of that, but I also, um, I guess my question is, is I'm a little confused and, and I'll echo what, what member gold said. It sounds like the school committee is going to adopt it, but it, does that mean this is the last conversation the school committee is having about the district improvement plan until it comes back to us as a group as sort of an almost finished product? Uh not necessarily. We could do updates as as we continue to move forward. Um, I think that there will be a, an opportunity for an update in July, at least. Probably an update for an up an opportunity for an update in August. Um, I I think that it is unlikely that you, it would be ready for a vote until September. But you you could definitely have two updates along the way, and and be able to provide feedback to the DIP team. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Superintendent, that having too many, I mean, you've already got 20 some people and, and that's an unwieldy group to try and, and make decisions, although I imagine there will be subcommittees. So having too many folks from the school committee probably wouldn't be super helpful, but I think if there were opportunities to bring drafts and updates for input, that that would be helpful. I guess I have one other question, which is as you're talking about the need for the district improvement plan to really focus on reentry and reintegration into the schools. Um, I guess my question is, in your mind, what percentage of the district improvement plan will be specifically about, about that versus sort of the rest of the conversation we've had today? And, and certainly there's, there's some overlap but I guess I'm a little concerned that we lose an opportunity to focus on, on some of the real needs of our district, if only focusing on, on re-entry into the schools. So I think of it in terms of the difference between strategy and tactics. I think that um, the district improvement plan should, should identify strategies. And I think a lot of what, um, is involved with reopening is going to be more tactical level decisions. Um, so there is a there is a level of overlap, but I don't think that um, I don't think that district improvement plan would or should be a list of steps we need to take in order to get schools fully reopened. Okay. Does that yeah. answer the question? It does. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I guess I would add that my hope is that the district improvement plan would not simply be strategies, but but overarching goals that drive the strategies. I, I understand what you're saying. Member Fallon, you have your hand up next. Um, thanks. I was just going to say that um, I agree that too many members obviously would be problematic, but I would support having at least one other member on it just for the experience. I was on the um, the committee last time and I found it to be a very valuable experience. So I'm, I'm supportive if there's another member that wanted to join. Member Kaufman. Yes, me too. I agree with uh, member Fallon. I think having, a, I think having a second person would be great. A second representative from the uh, school committee. Member Busansky. I also agree. Having a second member would be, uh, I think could be useful, but more than that, I think then it probably does get a little out of control. So uh, any volunteers to be that second member? Are there any members that are interested um, in being that second member? You could obviously contact Dr. Provost after the meeting. Um, member Gold? Uh, oh, member Gold. Sorry, I thought you were raised. I thought you were asking who, if, if, or if anyone was interested at this point. But, uh, yeah. Was that a ra was that a raised hand of interest? Uh, yes, it was. Okay, but uh, I could also email Dr. Provost. If you member Levy. 
Same. Okay. Um, okay, so Member Gold and Member Levy. Um, Member Voss, you have your hand up. Mine is a hand and not a hand of interest at this point. <laughs> to say, I absolutely support the idea of two members. And if um, three members felt really strongly they wanted to participate, I would, so if, I would go so far as to say, consider all three if, if they want to do it. Uh, Dr. Provost. So I think there was consensus around two. Um, if, if there, I guess I would check for consensus around three. If there's consensus around three, then there's, I don't have to ask another question, but if there isn't, then I do. Okay. Uh, any members want to respond or express any concern about that? I'll take that as consensus, Dr. Provost. Oh, oh. oh I have a question. Member Fallon. Um, I was just wondering, I just thought about it, but is there gonna be any sort of an issue with um, subcommittee assignments and, and overlap on anything that we're discussing as far as open meeting law? Dr. Provost? So with the three members, Kaufman, Levy, and Gold, I think we're okay. I don't, I don't think there's a quorum of any subcommittee there. And someone check me on that. So yes. soon, are, are you on any similar overlapping committees together, Annie? I think you're okay. Okay. Right. Do, it doesn't constitute a quorum in any of the subcommittees. Member Kaufman. Yeah, I'm fine with three. And um, if we choose two, I just want to say, you know, as much as I'm honored to be asked, if we go with three, then I please just put me in the I don't consider me one of the three. Just consider let's let's find two people that are however whatever decision would be reached. I'm not sure how to narrow it from three to two, but at this point, uh, I'm happy with uh, uh, three of three members. I think that's still fine. I think uh, somebody mentioned to me that we had three on the last district improvement plan. Is that right? Member Fallon, do you remember? Yes, there are three of us, but I think it was a lot bigger group overall. Yeah. Okay, does that give you feedback, Dr. Provost, that you need? Yep, I'm all set. Okay, so um, unless there's any more questions on that particular item, we can move into um, the um, next items on the agenda, which is a series of votes. Um, some are sort of interrelated uh, to each other. Uh, votes C, D, and E are um, somewhat related um, uh, and are tied primarily to vote of item number C, which is a vote to approve the contract for the special education uh, director. Um, I see Ms. Lamica listed for this one. I don't know if you want to add anything, Ms. Lamica, uh, to this. No, I believe your um, packet included a draft employment agreement for Dr. Plummer. Okay. Um, so it would just be a matter of the school committee voting to approve the chair signing that contract if they choose to do so. Okay. So um, is there a motion uh, to approve that contract? Member Kaufman. Yeah, I want to um, just out of an abundance of caution, recuse myself from just this aspect to it. My wife does officially kind of work under Dr. Plummer's unit and report to her. So um, I did speak to the mayor and the um, ethics commission and it's a little unclear, but I just want to take an abundance of caution and recuse myself just from this vote. The others are fine and I'm going to go use the restroom. Perfect timing. Okay, thank you, Member Kaufman. Um, Okay, so I would entertain a motion to approve this uh, contract for Dr. Plummer. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Okay, made second. by Member Gold. Uh, and then there's a second by- Second. That, oh, Member Dusansky. Okay, so the motion's uh, made and seconded. Any further discussion? Um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member Goldman? Yes. 
Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narquitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. And Member Kaufman has recused, so uh, it is nine votes yes and one recusal. Okay, so um, that contract is approved. Um, congratulations, Dr. Plummer. I see you there. Thumbs up. Um, so the next item are two um, somewhat interrelated votes. Um, these are to approve two job descriptions uh, uh, within uh, the special education director's um, uh, organizational chart. And um, the first is to approve a grant coordinator uh, job description. Um, uh, Ms. Lamica, did you wanna say anything about that? I just, again, wanted to put that the job description um, was in your packet. It's a draft that um, was put together. Um, the position would be funded, a good portion of it would be funded by an indirect cost charged to our grants that we receive uh, would be the funding source of it um, and would allow some work to be coming out of the special ed office for proportional share and those kind of things to help support that office. Okay. Is there a motion to approve this job? Oh, Member Levy, sorry. I have a, I have a, I actually have a comment about the, the job descriptions. I don't know if I have to hold it until there's a motion to approve for us. Yeah, why don't we make a, why don't we have it, just get it on the table and then we can ask a question about it. Is there a, a motion to approve, to approve then? Okay, uh, Member uh, Levy moves to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Member Condon. Uh, Member Levy, you have the floor. Thanks. I um, I'd really like to see uh, an inclusion of um, diversity and inclusion language in all of our job descriptions that um, articulates um, both in terms of the duties as well as the minimum qualifications, um, uh, uh, both um, regardless of the position. Um, a commitment to working within or working with. Um, I'm happy to send sample language to folks, but I, I would really like to see, see more of an emphasis on that language in every one of our job descriptions. It, it both sends the message to our candidates and potential candidates that it's a value of our school district. And it also really sets the hiring team up to be able to include those criteria in their in their interviews and um, as, as criteria they're looking for moving forward. Okay, um, Ms. Lamica, our, our superintendent, um, uh, do you have any sure. comment on that? Yes. Yeah, it, it's, it has happened many times when one of these job descriptions have come forward that we've authorized some changes to be made after they're approved. And if um, Member Levy wants to send any language for um, inclusion in that posting or, or that job description, happy to do that um, after the meeting. Okay. So, um, um, is that acceptable, Member Levy, to just send something afterwards? Yeah, I'm super happy to do that. And again, it's my hope that that kind of language can be included in all of the future descriptions that we have moving forward. Okay. Any other questions or a member boss? Yeah, I, I'm fine with that for this time. I want to just echo that I do think we should have a almost a rubber stamp paragraph along these lines that are just automatically included in our job descriptions. And I feel like we've talked about this before. Um, member Levy, I believe it was you who was going to provide that for a previous one. Um, and I guess I'd I'd like to say I'm fine with these two job descriptions moving ahead on this do it behind the scene approach, but would also like for this language to be brought for us to all see and to start and, and to have feedback at some point and to start seeing it on all job application or, or job um, descriptions. 
Okay, um, Member Vysansky. I, I was also going to say something very similar to <laughs> Member Voss. Uh, Member Levy, I really appreciate, and I agree it's really important just to get this language standardized into our job descriptions. Would it be possible, in addition to working on it behind the scenes, that we put it on our next general school committee, if not next if not June 11th, the next one's agenda, just so we could all just take a look at, see what that looks like, that we're just gonna get standardized as a standardized addition to these job descriptions. And that might be a way to help um, the process. Uh, certainly, uh, we can uh, we can report, have a report back to you on what that language looks like and that Great. should be an issue. Um, Dr. Provost, you had your hand up. I don't know if that was from a previous question or no, it's for this. Thank you for recognizing me. I just wanted to, to point out that Member Voss, her, her recollection is accurate. Um, we did have a previous discussion with this, and there was action on it. To, to let you know what the resolution was, um, we changed, we added um, some standard language to all of our postings. Um, at that time, we had had a meeting with our HR director, and the feeling was that adding the language to the postings was, was the more strategic thing to do because that is the outward looking document that job seekers see first. Um, but I, I don't have an, an objection to adding it to the job descriptions as well, if that's the, if that's the committee's pleasure. Okay, so um, we'll bring something back for the community to look at at a future date. Um, the motion that's on the table right now is to approve the job description uh, for the grant coordinator position. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member, <clears throat> Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Member Fallon? Yes. <laughs> Member Seraphie Cox? Yes, and I'm having technical difficulties, so I need to restart my computer. So I'm going to exit the meeting and then return. Okay. Uh, Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that one um, is approved. So now the next item on the agenda is a vote to approve the transition educator job description. Again, uh, related back to the special education department. Uh, Ms. Lamica, do you have anything to add to this point, this one? So this one, I again, was in the packet. I just wanted to make sure um, the committee remembered that this was part of the original budget proposal that was passed that was part of the set piece we just, when we went to post some of these positions for anticipated um, openings, we realized we didn't have a job description for the transition educator. So we needed to um, get the committee to approve the job description. Our motion to approve the job description for transition educator. Correct. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Um, so the motion was made by member Fallon and I believe, um, I did, uh, member Goldman seconded that I believe. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the motion has been made and seconded. I'm just looking to see has, um, member Serapy Cox made it back in to the meeting. Oh. I just wanted to. Um, I, I don't see her in the waiting room yet. So, um, Member Boss, you had your uh, you had your hand up. While we're waiting, just making sure I said it already, but I didn't realize it was a separate motion that we could use the same language that Member Levy is going to work on for this one as well. Just to make sure that was clear. 
I believe that's the intent, yes. Um, okay, well, uh, are there any further discussions on this? I'll ask the um, clerk to call the roll and I'll keep an eye on the waiting room as you do that. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narquist? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Uh, we don't have Member Seraphie Cox back yet. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. And Member Kaufman? Yes. Uh, nine votes in favor of the motion and one absent, temporarily absent. You're muted, Mayor. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the next item on the agenda um, is a vote to ratify the uh, uh, a stipend's addendum to the memorandum of agreement with the Northampton Association of um, School Employees, NACE. And um, we did have member Seraphie Cox uh, listed as the person who would speak to this item. Um, I know she needed to do a reboot of the computer. I know sometimes that can take a little while. Um, so, and of course the next item on the agenda well, why don't we, um, while we wait for member Seraphie Cox to come back, why don't we move to item uh, G, um, which is a vote to authorize impact bargaining over Leeds preschool CPPI implementation. And I can ask Dr. Provost to explain that or, or not, or just Thank you. description. Thank you. And th with this item, I'd be asking for a vote to authorize the negotiation subcommittee to approach NACE about funding the one of the preschool positions it leads to the CPPI grant. We have funds that would be available to um, fund the position. So this is just changing the source of funding for current staff. However, in order to use that money, um, we would need to change the, the staff's um, working conditions slightly. So that would have to be negotiated and agreed to, but it's a strategy that would allow us to use grant funding more effectively in order to um, prepare for some of the financial shocks that may come in the upcoming year. So I think it is a, um, a, good, a good thing to attempt. It creates more flexibility for the district financially and it maintains jobs and, and, and programs. Thank you. Um I'm not. I'm not seeing um, Member Serapy Cox in the waiting room. Um, are you able to see her in the waiting room, Annie? Okay. So I don't know. I whether, do not see her. Don't know whether she's in. Um, uh, has gone into a different waiting room. Um, but I do not see her in the waiting room. So folks can communicate with her um, to utilize the link. Um, that was sent out. Oh, there she is. She's out there. She's just appeared. Okay, are you back with us, Member Seraphie Cox? Member Seraphie Cox. There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, is it my turn to vote or something? Uh, no, not at all. I just wanted to make sure you were back in because we were there was some uh, there was some delay in you appearing in the waiting room. Um, so I'm um, uh, where we actually moved uh, beyond the item uh, that we were going to have you talk about, which was item F, and we just moved ahead to item G while we were waiting. Um, so if someone would be willing uh, to make the motion um, to authorize the negotiating subcommittee to um, uh, to uh, approach NACE about that issue, would someone be willing to do that? As outlined in item G. Motion to authorize impact bargaining over Leeds preschool CPPI implementation. Second. Okay, so there's been a ma motion made by member Gold and seconded by member Fallon. 
any further discussion? Hearing none, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Just a moment, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. I have a, I have a question. Um, Member Voss. Uh, you're muted, Member Voss. Dr. Provost or somebody, can you just help me make sure I understand, um, and, and maybe if it has to be executive session, that's fine, you can say that, but I'm not sure I understand what impact bargaining means. I understand what you're saying is you want to rearrange funding to a grant, I think is what you're saying, but is there anything special about impact bargaining? I don't know what it is. No, so the, the essence of it is that it's not reopening the collective bargaining agreement. It's not changing anything for the, um, the members as a whole. But if we were to make this change in the funding source, there would be an impact on a specific employee that, that would need to be negotiated. Thank you. Okay, um, is the clerk ready to call the roll? I am. Okay, proceed. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes, yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Seraphie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so that um, uh, uh, impact bargaining uh, request is approved. Uh, we'll now move back to item F, uh, which is a vote to ratify the NACE stipends addendum to the uh, memorandum of agreement. And I'll turn to member Seraphie Cox to give us a description, uh, maybe to, uh, give us a description, make a motion, and we can. Um, go from there. Sure. Uh, I first want to um, make sure that all of the members of the committee have the correct document. I believe that the document that uh, the clerk sent out this evening was the incorrect document. What you should have says proposed memorandum of agreement from Northampton School Committee 51520 at the top. Is that what people are looking at? No. I Okay, Annie, I forwarded you the correct document um, maybe 20, 30 minutes ago. So if you could- uh, I got it, I'll, sh I'll, I'll share it with everyone. Thank you so much. Um, since, do normally would we uh, have this for the public to see? Like, because this is on TV, do I need to read it? What, what is the practice? Um, you know, we've negotiated it. Uh, you could certainly give a description of what the changes are. Um, okay. And if you want to, uh, I don't know if you want to read it verbatim, you could, but you could also just give a general description of what the change, the essence of the changes are, um, just so that the public has an understanding of what's been, um, what's been agreed to. Very good. So um, the, the, I mean, the main I think the big news of this is that this is the final step for the school committee uh, and NACE to come to um, uh, the, the final step before the signing of, of the contracts. It, this was the final um, piece of the uh, tentative bargaining agreement that uh, needed to be uh, cleared up and, uh, and was done so. So there are um, um, the, the main things that we came to agreement about uh, is adding child-in-law to the um, bereavement language so that people um, whose children's spouses um, pass away can go to their, um, uh, to their funerals or have bereavement leave in, in that event. Um, in addition, um, the other uh, the other items that we talked about is related to stipends. So we uh, uh, recognize that there are folks who are on stipends that have been doing work during this closure, and it was not something that was previously 
Thank you, Annie. It was not something that was previously um, taken into consideration in our previous memorandums of agreement. So um, the agreement outlines the way that uh, stipended um, positions will be paid for, uh, for, this, uh, for this term um, during the, the shutdown. It, it also outlines, um, uh, clarifies a, a concern around um, cost of living increases, otherwise known as COLAs, that, um, that was uh, unclear between the parties uh, previously. And um, so the, let me see other things to, it also clarifies which of the athletic coaches will be paid uh, during this time and, uh, and at what amount. Um, so the, um, I think that that's uh, the, the basics that I, that I need to, uh, to present. Um, as I have said before in our meetings, but I will say again, the, uh, the conversations with NACE have been incredibly productive and, um, and useful in terms of making sure that our uh, employees are feeling uh, supported during this time, as well as also just uh, continuing dialogue between the, the committee and, uh, and uh, the NACE leadership. So that, uh, that has been, uh, been productive. So even though we're not in contract negotiations, it's, it's been uh, an intense spring. Uh, I really want to thank uh, both the members of the negotiating subcommittee for their time and, and passion and, um, and clarity and, um, and time, uh, as well as uh, the members of the negotiating team for NACE uh, for their clarity and time and commitment and passion and time. Thank you very much, um, uh, Member uh, Serafi Cox. Would you be willing to now make a motion to for the school committee to ratify? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Uh, that's seconded. By Member Kaufman, I believe. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so the motion has been made and seconded. If there's no further questions, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkwitz. Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. And Member Goldman? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so the uh, the uh, addendum is ratified, and um, again, thank you to the members of our negotiating uh, subcommittee for their work and diligence on this. Um, so the final item on tonight's agenda is a um, is item H, and it is a discussion of FY twenty one financial strategy, um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost for that. Thank you. And this item is presented just in the, the spirit of doing my due diligence and making sure that I keep the school committee informed of all options. It's not um, certainly not made in, in terms of a recommendation. Um, as, as many of us uh, or, or many we discussed many times during the budget process. One of the things that is um, always challenging is the school committee has to set its budget before the city budget is known and, and before the state budget is known. Um, specifically, I think the, the question marks around the state budget are the biggest ones because they have such a large impact and because they come in so late. Um, it's not unusual for um, 
the state to go right up to the end of the fiscal year to finalize a budget. Um, it's not even unusual for them to begin the new fiscal year without a budget. Um, what is unusual about the times we're currently in is here we're starting June and there's still no consensus for state budget writers on what their revenue picture looks like. Um, so we are entering um, a time of financial uncertainty that is greater than any I've experienced in my career, for sure. And I do believe, uh, and we're also coming up on a statutory notification deadline um, around non-professional or teachers of non-professional status. Um, and in our case, it extends to more employees than that because we have a contractual notification that aligns with that of June 15th for many of our employees who are not teachers. Um, so uh, you may be hearing other districts um, beginning a process of non-renewing non-professional teachers or not providing um, reasonable assurance letters for the, the fall. I, it's our intention at this time to bring everybody back and so I don't, I'm not recommending that as an action. I think it will disrupt a lot of lives and will cause us to lose good people and it will also cause us to, um, to incur unemployment costs that will then only worsen our financial situation. However, I don't want you to, um, I don't want you to be in the situation of seeing other districts begin to take measures and, and then asking me about it and my having to come back to you and saying it's too late for that. Um, so I just need to inform you that if there's any, um, any thought on the committee that you may want to do anything with um, staff regarding possibly not providing reasonable assurance letters or um, um, beginning the process of non-renewal, we would need to know that. Um, we'd need to put it on for a vote for the next school committee meeting and we probably would have to be doing some work between now and then to prepare it. Um, so that's, I think it's important that the committee knows what its options are and gives us direction on what options it wants us to follow at this time. Is there any um, feedback? Member Serafie Cox. Yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this, uh, this agenda item. Uh, I find it to be incredibly proactive and, um, and appreciate hearing both your, your, um, you know, opinion about not wanting to, uh, to disrupt lives and lose uh, valuable staff members. Um, but also like just coming to us and honestly saying, this is what the picture looks like. Um, I would love to have um, this, you know, this, this is the proactive uh, sort of approach um, uh, and vision that, that, I'm, that I'm really excited uh, to see happen. Uh, and I, I think that I, I, I would like to hear what other committee members have to say, but I would, I think, come down uh, on the same side as what you were talking about, uh, member, uh, sorry, uh, Superintendent Provost, uh, to, to not uh, send those, sorry, to yes, send those letters and not um, change our normal practice. Member Condon. Uh, I, I also would like to voice my appreciation for uh, this information sooner rather than later um, and, and personally voice my opinion uh, that I agree with your recommendation regarding uh, retaining those personnel and not sending out those letters and not eliminating them. Member Fallon. Yeah, um, I just, I agree with my colleagues. I would, um, I appreciate you bringing this before us and I support the decision to bring everyone back if at all possible. Member Goldman. Yeah, I agree um, at this. From the information I have, I'd like to bring everyone back at this time. Member Gold. Yes, I would, as I think we all do, as it sounds like, would want to offer those letters of assurance to even non PT uh, professional teacher te uh, staff. I guess my question is: Are you do you feel at this point confident that it, that it's not at all 
misleading to the non-professional teachers that the reasonable assurance letters have um, that you know that they are yeah there's confidence behind offering that in term knowing the uncertainty of what's ahead of us um, you know and I guess I'm asking in terms of I know each year schools and districts have uh, attrition that they're balancing and all these other factors whether it's retirements and things like that and so I mean on that level are you seeing something or is there are, are there indicators that are leading you to feel that we're not going to have to go down this rabbit hole of um, telling people, oh, we're mistaken. We should have let you know that it's possible we'd have to cut. And again, I'm asked, I'm sharing this with the hopes that we can bring everything, everyone back. I just, um, I have been in the position. I know teachers have been in the position that, you know, if they were given the heads up of knowing they might need to look elsewhere, they would have liked a, a longer time to, to know that. So I, I will share, I'll share my, my moral reasoning on that and hopefully it resonates. Um, my, my understanding of deception is in order to deceive someone, you have to know what you're saying is not true. Um, I have no idea what the, what the budget picture is going to be like for next year at the state level. So I can't, I can't say that it is, um, that I would be misleading people if I if I said that I, I think we can bring you back. At this point, um, I don't have any information. And so I think that it's truthful to say, our intention is to bring everyone back. We're going to do everything we can to bring everyone back. There may be things outside of our control, but we have no idea what they may be at this time. And so I think that's a truthful stance to take. Um, Member Voss. Um, I'm just lowering my hand. I was essentially going to ask a similar question. Um, I fully support this approach and I'm also just, I, I don't see how we can't bring everybody back having just done the budget and realizing that we have no extra people. And so, um, and, and we're going to need more people to catch students up and to have smaller classes. And I, I guess I do have something to say. You know, I, the next meeting, we're going to hear these different scenarios, and I guess I feel like once we understand what those are, what some of the trade-offs are, we might have a better sense of where we could potentially make cuts, and hopefully it's not people and it's other things, and we're just going to have to work together and creatively figure out. We're going to, as a community, have to give stuff up to afford this, but my, I very strongly feel that any teachers or positions of um, our educators and support staff are the last to go, if, if at all possible. Member Levy. Uh, so I was going to say almost verbatim what Member Voss did, but I guess the, the nuance that I bring to this is my hope to actually clearly articulate that to folks so that they, I, I guess, sort of combining what Member Voss um, and Member Gold just said, it would be really nice if we could have as much transparency as possible. And maybe Superintendent, this is already a, a part of your intention, but to say in the letter that we're really unsure of what the budget is gonna look like. We haven't gotten this information from, from the state and um, we are gonna need to work together creatively to find or to find creative solutions to, to whatever, we face from a budgetary standpoint. And our priority is to, to not cut people, not cut positions, but to find other solutions. But, but, but to be really clear that we don't know what lies ahead and to say all of that so that people sort of have that assurance that, okay, they're gonna try and do other things first. And some people may say, maybe I, I wanna look elsewhere knowing that we're, there's this lack of clarity. So just to take what they both said and to ensure that it's a, a clearly and transparently communicated uh, piece. Dr. Provost, did you wanna thumbs up on that or? Yeah, I, I think I do need to check with HR and just with legal on this because there could be some constraints about what what you can put in a reasonable assurance letter. However, Member Levy has 
summarize what's in my heart right now. I just sometimes in our communi our official communications, we're not always able to write what's in our heart. So that's the only thing that prevents me from giving a full thumbs up. Okay, uh, Member Gold. Uh, yeah, first, just to clarify, I didn't mean to suggest, sorry if it came up uh, that possibly there was deception going on. I didn't mean that at all. Um, it was really just around that I know that, you know, you must be getting, um, you know, at this time of year, you're hearing of teachers, whether they're leaving the district or retiring. Um, and I mean, if I feel like that could be, I, I feel like that's the only indicating thing beyond the unknown that we could know. And, uh, you know, just knowing if that is um, similar to previous years, it's lower than previous years, higher than previous years, like that then maybe um, provides some more assurance that um, all the positions can be brought back, if you know what I mean? Like that there's more confidence behind that. I don't know if that is clear or not. I could. Sure. I, I feel a little bit out of touch with that working from home. Um, Cammie might know more about the retirements than I do. Sure. So we, we have probably had just about the same number of retirements um, as we've done in the last year or two. What we have seen this year, to be honest, is we've actually had a couple of people call and inquire about taking back their retirement notice um, and rescinding it, um, which is not something that I've seen the past couple of years. And I think it's just given the times right now. Um, so that, that's sort of hanging out there. Um, but I have budgeted their full positions, not knowing whether they would definitely be going or not. Um, so one of the things that we have to take a look at is um, the federal government has put out there the ESSER grant for school districts. So that would be one of those pieces that we would look at filling the gaps of what we would need. And we haven't committed to what that money would be. We haven't applied for it yet. Um, so those are the things that we would need to weigh out once the state budget's passed. And that's what's happened in past recessions is there's another funding source that helps fill those gaps of if the state cuts our numbers, the federal government provides funding that will help us fill those gaps to get us through. Um, in between that and trying to see where we're gonna close out this year um, are some of those things that will come together. And as soon as we have a lot of specific information about that, um, I will definitely bring that back to school committee. Um, unfortunately, it takes till about July before we actually close out the books in the middle of July. Um, and then we won't get the state budget. I keep predicting and guessing maybe till the end of August. Um, so as soon as we have that information, we'll bring it back to the committee and what the school, uh, what the city would look at by the time they determine what happens on the state level, how it impacts the city level and what they would look to the school department for. That all takes a little bit of time. Um, and the only thing I would keep the members in their mind is to make sure that, so once we know those numbers, we would need to take a look at the financial situation at that point that we know for sure, and then make decisions as soon as possible if we needed to adjust something at that point. But I don't see it being the beginning of July. I, I, I would say it's gonna be the fall before we actually even know anything. Member Kaufman. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say I, I, I more or less agree with everything that's said, but I just want to add, you know, the, the our budget is dependent on what the city gives us outside of grants. And um, for those of you who didn't see, the city budget was presented by the mayor and passed, I believe, last week. Correct me if I'm wrong, just, but it was just presented. It hasn't there's a hearing on it tomorrow night. Just I'm just sorry, presented and, at this point. Yeah. Um, but it's worth a read. And um, I think the mayor was very honest in that. Um, and why he's currently holding the Northampton schools and the Smith Vocational School harmless. And the raise is that we, the increases, I should say, to our budget that we went through um, many, many meetings discussing and negotiating um, are retained at this point. So the city is laying off several people or at least not rehiring open positions, um, but it hasn't hit us. So um, I wanted to express my public appreciation for that and acknowledge what I said earlier today, which is that the report itself indicated, you know, a strong constructive relationship with the city, but it's more powerful than that. And between the mayor and the city council, there's a 
tremendous amount of support for our schools and um, the fact that the city budget is already suffering and many people are losing their their positions if it if things go through and we're being held harmless to date um, provides some optimism for me at least that um, we're going to be we're going to be okay that's how i currently feel okay um I'll, i will just say that there is a line in my budget message that reiterate sort of what Cami said, which is we still don't have a state budget yet. So we don't, uh, we're sort of, we're making the best estimates we have based on our own local revenue, which is tanking. Um, but there is that still question mark of the unknown. So we're, yeah, we're all sort of both in uncharted waters, but we're trying to do the, what we can do right now, given the numbers we have. Um, so any other questions for the superintendent? Do you feel you have what you need in terms of, uh, this meeting and and the, obviously thank you for your proact proactiveness in terms of seeking input at this phase and maybe we'll have something more to report as we move forward um, along through June and into July. Yes, I have what I need. I thank the committee for their direction. Okay, so um, thank you. So that is the um, final item of uh, tonight's uh, posted agenda. Um, in terms, we do have several future business and meeting dates, uh, which are listed on our agenda. Um, and so the, um, um, hmm, budget and property subcommittee, Wednesday, June 3rd, the next school committee meeting is Thursday, June 11th, and the rules and policy subcommittee on, uh, Wednesday, June 17th. Um, with that, I would enter. Oh, Member Busansky, you have your hand up. Sorry. Thank you. I don't believe that budget and property is uh, meeting tomorrow. Is that correct, Annie? We've postponed, okay. or that's correct. It's okay. on the, the the correct meeting schedule is on the posted agenda, but maybe not on some of the ones that you have. So I apologize okay. for that. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify so yeah. the public know that right. we will not be meeting tomorrow. We're meeting at the end of June instead. Yeah. That's right. Um, I realized too that I have the Thursday, May 28th agenda that I'm reading off of. So there's probably been some changes since we moved the meeting to Tuesday. So, um, um, but I believe adjournment is a correct item on this agenda, on, on any agenda. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn if there was Motion one. to adjourn. Okay. Um, second. In, in a perfect yeah. harmony. Uh, there is a motion made and seconded. Um, uh, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narquist? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. And Member Voss? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so the motion uh, passes and the uh, June 2nd meeting of the Northampton School Committee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.